Looks like everyone is here. Um, welcome everyone to the Stone for Development Work Integrated Learning and Action Research final project presentations. I'm Dr. Gary Flomenhoft. I'm a research fellow with the Development Minerals Program at the Sustainable Minerals Institute at the University of Queensland, and I'm the coordinator of this course. For those who are attending as guests today or watching the recording later, I would like to give a short outline of the program before we go into the presentations. Development minerals are those construction, industrial, agricultural, and artisanal minerals that are mined or quarried locally and comprise 84% of minerals by volume globally. Stone for Development is a 120 hour work integrated learning course developed at the University of Queensland and supported by UNESCO Geosciences Division and the Fiji Ministry of Lands and Resources. Our thanks to Oslam Andiam Lopez at UNESCO and Permanent Secretary Rajeli Taga at the Fiji Ministry of Lands and Resources. The course consisted of 40 hours of online training in December, followed by 80 hours of project work supervised by our project leaders globally. The online training was presented by faculty at the University of Queensland, and I want to express my thanks to them for their contribution, especially to Daniel Franks, our project leader who originated the course. That also includes Artem Golov, Linda Lawson, Paul Rogers, Fitzum Wilde Georges, and Patrick Jr. I especially want to thank our global project leaders and course participants for their great work and also to all the project partners and stakeholders who contributed to the success of the projects. Next, I'll give an outline of the presentations and the project leaders. The presentations will be 15 minutes, followed by five minutes of questions for each one. We'll have, we'll have seven uh, presentations this, for this session. Uh, the first one is unlocking the value of development minerals in selected African countries. The second will be the potential of clay in Ghana. I, I forgot to mention um, the, the first project unlocking the value is uh, led by Dr. Anthony Mamous from Zimbabwe. The potential of clay in Ghana is led by Dr. Ishmael Kweku from Ghana. Uh, the Philippines group has two sections um, on transforming quarry waste and that's led by Dr. Take, uh, Kate Tongpalan. And then uh, after we'll have a short break, and then we'll have the um, development of products from development minerals focusing on uh, aerated concrete blocks. That is uh, led by Professor Ufi Chinje, and uh, the project was coordinated by Patrick Lamonia, um, who's a lecturer there. And then we have the use of waste in building materials in India led by Dr. Shuman Mehti. And then finally, uh, the sand mining problem in Zambia led by Dr. Wilson Mwandira. So that is, uh, that is the summary of our program. And um, as a reminder, uh, please keep your microphone muted. And if you can uh, turn on your video without uh, ruining your sound quality, please do, because we like to see your face and then we can pretend we're all uh, together, even though we're in cyberspace. Okay. Um, with that, I will turn it over to the uh, the uh, unlocking the value of development minerals in selected countries uh, project. You can share your screen and uh, and then go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I hope my voice is clear. Yes, we can hear you. Go, go right ahead. Right. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Foybe Wahengo, and I'm here to get us started on the project or presentation on unlocking the value of development minerals through materials characterization. As we have heard, it was led by Dr. Anthony Mamuse. So today we are mainly going to put you through or take you through what we have researched on or the minerals that we have researched on and their innovative uses. And we are going to be presenting the three out of the seven that we have studied. 
And we are going to highlight on the impact these minerals would actually have on the sustainable development goals, as well as touch on what we have suggested as being the future research going forward. This project was actually um, initiated from the fact that there is lack of data on development minerals, especially in developing countries. And these um, from literature has shown that there is potential to initiate local economies via alternative use of these uh, 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 development minerals. Hence, we tried to address a need to assess and explore these development minerals and their potential uses in our respective countries by having team members from different countries actually impact on exploring these local opportunities. As I have said before, we had about seven minerals that we looked at. However, we are going to be looking or presenting only on the top three that are highlighted in red there, which is silica in terms of quartz from the perspective of Ghana and Nigeria countries, looking at the innovative use as photovoltaic cells. And then Laha from the Philippines in respective of building substrates and then limestone in Zambia, looking at the agricultural use of limestone. To start on, Limestone is a sedimentary rock with about 50% or more of calcium carbonate, and it is actually widely distributed in Zambia. Limestone is of vital importance due to its industry, chemical and environmental uses. So limestone products are actually used for different um, or in different applications. For example, quick lime, hydrated lime and agricultural lime. These are used mainly for S neutralizing agents. And then we have flaxstone as well as crusher run. The flaxstone is used mainly in metallurgical um, industry as well as domestically. And crusher run is known for the gravel uh, because of its durability um, uh, in, in terms of making the gravel um, or the roadway stronger. So, in Zambia, I focused on limestone due to its uh, abundance within the country. And we also have established um, uh, in, in limestone industries within Zambia. But what we have found out is that there is an underutilization of agricultural uh, lime or limestone in, in, in SA, an agricultural lime because of how it is actually packaged, number one. It's cost prohibitive to rural or subsistence farmers as well as small scale farmers looking at that perspective. And because the packaging is in bigger volumes, one time bags are very hard to handle to this or for these farmers. The second one um, is a distribution cost, which is not op optimal due to um, centralization sources of production, which also adds to the cost of accessing this agri line. In Zambia, we have acidic soils, which possess threat to subsistence and small scale farmers. And what we have found out is that agricultural lime is actually one of the major solution that can help to bring back this soil fertility. And therefore, the aforementioned issues need to be addressed in order to to have the agri lime accessible to the subsistence as well as small scale farmers, especially that since COVID-19, many people really resorted to gardening as well as crop farming as their main source of food and income. Hence, to address the food security issues within Zambia, we looked at perhaps um, um, things like government coming in to help um, these farmers being, uh, to be able to assess uh, or access this agri lime uh, by having some subsidies or adding some subsidies on this agri lime, um, just like they are doing with the agricultural uh, fertilizers. And also looking at restructuring the distribution of agri lime for accessibility to farmers and identifying agricultural bodies in Zambia that can actually assist in um, these farmers getting hold of this agricultural line. And also um, we found out that they, 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 there is a need for distribution, uh, distribution centers that can also help them to redistribute these um, agri line 
to the subsistence as well as small scale farmers. And in this um, um, table that you are seeing, I actually divided these, um, these things that we have suggested into two, the easy to do and hard to do. Easy to do being those ones that can, um, that will take less money and less time to implement. And the hard to do would be those ones that would be taking longer or having a high capital to start. Um, I thank you and I hand over to my um, my colleague to pass uh, to 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 go as uh, or to take us through the next slides. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. The next slide we'll be looking at the uh, silica um, in terms of converting it to PV cells for solar panels. A uh, major focus in which we decided to choose this mineral is due to the current situation within which um, both countries in Nigeria and Ghana find ourselves in terms of energy crisis in the gap of creating an alternative that will supplement the natural um, energy grid that the countries both lie on. So silica most of the times is found, it's an abundant and widely distributed mineral that occur at the surface of the earth. Um, it minerals has been mainly a mine on the large scales, which have been used for applications, which also in other sense has been used in converting it into PV cells, which generates at the end for solar panels. Can we can move to the next slide. The next slide, please. So in here you can we can see the locations of the raw materials in both both countries, Ghana and Nigeria. We can see from here that they come in huge quantities all over the country. And there are specific areas that are more in abundance over them. And they are, um, they've been able to also establish labs in the various countries where these materials are being tested and are being prepared to be used for the solar panels. So in Ghana, the, the SES laboratory system in Ghana have offices and laboratory across the various locations, including Accra, Temma. It's the same also applies to Nigeria. This is the next slide. Existing technology and feature use. Um, our proposed research is that is the use of silica for PVs using electro as an alternative to higher temperature methods use. <laughs> so these are the two um, technologies that are currently in existence in the use in converting of the minerals into P, PV cells that are also being used in the manufacturing of the solar panels. And our future plans is that we are looking for funding for research and development into this project, which will help us at the end cut down the cost in the production of, of solar panels and also the importation of solar panels in this country. When these manufacturing plants are established within each country or any African country, it will cut down the, the cost of importation of solar panels and at the end will lead to increasing energy access to the rural areas and everywhere so that it can bridge the energy demand. And also we are looking at establishing a policy framework development, which will enable or create the environment for investors to come in, to be able to, into the strategy, the PI for PV cells to be used as solar panels in the various countries. Thank you very much.
Delhi, you yes, may okay. go ahead, please. Okay, so lahar is a volcanic debris flow deposit that is triggered by the oversaturation of such bioplastic material along volcanic edifices from either hydrometeorological or anthropogenic factors. This volcanic hazard has a wide range of grain size spanning the entirety of the Odin one third scale. Much of the material are tophaceous and endocytic in mineralogy, particularly for Mount Pinatubo. As a geohazard, its concrete slurry-like character coupled with the speed that reaches up to 80 kilometers per hour and can reach as far as 80 kilometers in span means that it is highly destructive. In the Philippines, lahar is actively being extracted by medium, small, and micro-scale entrepreneurs that set up dredging plants and quarries, mostly in Porak River, a major channel of Mount Pinatubo. These materials are actively used in the ongoing development projects in the country since lahar sand has been proven to be structurally capable for engineering purposes. Next slide, please. So several papers have examined the connections of lahar in agriculture such that the material has introduced significant chemical benefits for crops, but it is texturally inappropriate for plant growth. The focus of the proposed innovative use is in the biological, environmental, and engineering approach. A handful of researchers explore the use of the material for pest control purposes by using the material as foundation by laying down compacted lahar of about five centimeters thick, composed of the very coarse sand to granule fraction, which is then overlain by the actual concrete. They have observed the structure over a span of five years and found out that termites weren't able to penetrate the layer. Now, since most of the low-cost housing in the country are mostly composed of wood and other lighting materials, we have decided on expanding on this concept by using the material as an additional slab in between the walls to theoretically prevent the entry of these pests from the sides. Let's also hypothesize that the slabs increases the overall structural integrity, which is further critical in countries within the, the typhoon belt. Of course, no testing and mock-ups has been done due to the limitations of the course, so these are subject for further examinations. The other issue that comes from this is the increase in the building cost. Next slide, please. So this then offers the benefits of adding value to something that has originally been a problem. Uh, it increases the revenue streams of the micro scale and medium uh, entrepreneurs that extract the material should they seek to manufacture the wall slabs, which will undoubtedly create more jobs. The possible stakeholders for are, of course, the companies that extract the material, such as those MSMEs and even large corporations. Both the government and NGOs involved with affordable housing and home building are also foreseen as appropriate stakeholders for this Lahar slab. Next slide, please. So now the real value of development minerals lie on their impact and contribution to the sustainable development goals of UN. The agricultural line project sees agricultural benefits such as that it will improve the food security and thus eliminating hunger and poverty by increasing the food supply while providing more job opportunities. The Quartz PV project will inevitably contribute to affordable and clean energy such that it could help increase the available energy supply, which reduces the costs. Harnessing solar energy is also a sustainable way with reduced environmental impact. Lastly, the Lahar slabs have overlapping contribution to the first two. Uh, this project will contribute to the local economy by providing jobs improves existing housing conditions, as well as by expanding on the value of a once problematic material. Next slide, please. The temporal and spatial constraints of the project and the group limited the reach of our proposed innovations. However, uh, we propose the following. Uh, should there be interested parties to move forward with the discussed uses. The AgriLine project recommends engaging with stakeholders to figure out the best ways for farmers to access the material. There should also be field investigation along with information and education campaigns. The solar PV project has already been discussed previously. So they have suggested chemical experimentation of the material for harnessing the quartz and converting them into solar cells. The Lahar project desires project mock-ups to determine the validity of its inferred benefits. Should it be proven successful, Government intervention is desired to counteract the cost issue that comes from the increased amount of building materials, possibly by providing subsidies. Next slide, please. So the group is grateful for UNESCO and the University of Queensland, Dr. Daniel, Dr. Gary, and others for the opportunity 
to be a part of this eye-opening and engaging course. We'd also like to thank Dr. Anthony Mamous for guiding the group and providing valuable feedback and help along the way. We also thank our mentors, Alicia and Moses, for their patience and support for all aspects of the project ex execution, and also the stakeholders and partners who took the time to be with us here today. Lastly, we would like to commend everyone in the group for the time and contribution for the completion and the success of this project. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. And you are right on target for 15 minutes. So great job on, uh, on the timing. Um, and uh, appreciate your, uh, your comprehensive look at all these products. Um, I actually have a, a question to start things off um, regarding the photovoltaics. Is there any uh, current um, manufacturing uh, or refining of, of uh, silica materials or any kind of um, photovoltaic production in either Ghana and Nigeria? And if not, have uh, you done, have you um, tried to contact any um, of the uh, of the Chinese representatives? Because I believe that China manufactures something like 80% of, of the photovoltaics in the world. And I believe that uh, they're, they're, they're very much engaged um, in Africa. And I do see another question uh, in the chat. So I forgot to mention, please put your questions in the chat or raise your hand using the reactions button uh, at the bottom and I'll call on you. So if you could answer that question, then we'll go to the one in the chat. Yes, thank you very good. Um, yes, there is a manufacturing plant in Ghana and I think also in Nigeria too, because my teammate was also, she drew my attention to that. And she has been in contact with some of them at Nigeria. Yes. So there's some manufacturing plants, but not on a larger scale in Ghana. But there are policies just um, last year or so the government started drawing policies looking at how to um, get them on a larger scale. Because they found a more deposit of them uh, within the country. So they are looking at creating the environment for investors to come and mine those ones. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the question in the chat says, uh, concerning the easy things to do, what, uh, what do you recommend that can be implemented if we wanna start such a project locally? And I, I think, uh, it, I think uh, that person is referring to the, to the agri line. And if they are on, uh, if they want to uh, uh, unmute their mic, they can uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Gary. Um, to respond to that, I think um, the first thing we need to do is to know what type of soil uh, do we have in that community? Because um, the as I as I've mentioned earlier to say that agri lime is a neutralizing agent which looks actually at uh, correcting acidic soils. So when you start to from that, I think then it will be easier for you to know will you really be in need of this agri lime or not as a community. So, um, and I believe that we would need, um, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure, sure whether it is through the agricultural um, department in the country or in the, in the area that can actually then offer such expertise so that they are able to, 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 uh, to, to assist the community in testing the soils and also then finding out what is the way forward. What is the, what, what are they actually, um, uh, what do they know? about the, the farming and agricultural addition to the soil. That would um, be the starting point I would want to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, from Raymond. Um, he's asking, do these uh, PVs, photovoltaics, have varieties on a scale and these varieties can affect products? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what he means, but I, I happen to know about photovoltaics. There's, there's um, there's single crystal, there's, there's polycrystalline, there's um, uh, like, there's other types of PVs and they each, they each require different materials. So, so maybe uh, that's what he's re referring to. The thin film is the third one of the, 
<clears throat> so there's there's uh, there's those three different kinds. So it, do they need different uh, types of silica for each one? I think that's what he's asking. Is that a tough one? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, I I I I think so that they have some uh, magnitude of effect on the PV. Even looking at the the manufacturing processes that each material goes through before the final PV cells are actually done, you you realize that in terms of values or in terms of ratio, there is some magnitude of um, changes or some magnitude of effect that it has the varieties of the PVs have at the end of its product. And and isn't the isn't the silica uh, required for photovoltaic of a very high purity? It's not just any any quartz that you can use. You need to use a very uh, high level yes. of purity of silica. Isn't that correct? Yes. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. And 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 how much of that type of uh, silica was available uh, in those two countries? Do you know that, or is that something that would have to be done with future research? Um, I think that will have to be done in future research um, as we move forward into it. But the quantities um, in terms of the various countries, I, I can't really pinpoint the figure of head to it. Yeah, okay. But there so... is across the, 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 the country, both countries. So there's a wide availability of, uh, of, of silica, but uh, you need, would need additional research to, to determine the, the purity mm -hmm. level. So, okay, I appreciate that. Um, all right, any, any further questions? Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And the next uh, group is the uh, potential of clay. Uh, in Ghana, and they did send me their PowerPoint. So if you need me to post it, that's fine. Otherwise, I'll have you share your screen and uh, go ahead with the um, with the uh, potential of clay in Ghana. Good morning, everyone. Please just give me a second. Uh, Good morning, Daniel. Yes, we see your screen. Okay. Um, please, I hope my screen is visible now. Yes, looks good. Okay, good morning. My name is Daniel Tugli. Um, I'm representing a group from Ghana. We are working on unlocking the potential of the potential for local value addition to clay minerals. That's a case study in Ghana here. And um, we actually, during our uh, synopsis presentation, we presented that we'll be working from a town in the Volta region, but just to state that we actually had to change our location due to uh, accessibility. So going forward, we will not be mentioning that we worked in the Volta region, but rather in the east, uh, western region of Ghana. Um, so our, pro our presentation will span from the project background all the way through to our uh, results. That's what we got from testing the clay minerals, some clay minerals we had uh, uh, over here. Now, uh, Ghana, like we all know, as every country in the world, I suppose, has is endowed with a lot of minerals. We have in Ghana, we have gold, and for the purpose of 
this program where we have development minerals, we have the sand, the clay, and then we have some aggregates of diamonds uh, uh, as well. And um, in Ghana, the importance, or let me say the economic importance of clay in Ghana has been very much underrated in the sense that it's quite common, but there's no, um, there's there's no sector or no formal sector around it that is regular uh, regulating anything uh, uh, on it, especially when it comes to inventions and and and, and uh, formalization. So that took us to our concept, how we 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 decide to to do this work, and to 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 state this in Ghana. The clay minerals are easily found, like I said, I stated earlier, and a number of a huge number of people are involved in it. We have a lot of people and locals that are involved in this ceramic uh, uh, works, and it's been it's a, a contributing factor to poverty alleviation and and job creation in in our environment. But unfortunately for us, the uh, that is not formalized, and so it's very much underappreciated. Uh, due to this, this, uh, um, due to this, and so we, we as a group, we decided to take it upon ourselves to unlock the value, and then uh, the economic potential of this clay minerals in in the in the country by focusing on a particular um, uh, uh, area, and then basing our, our, our uh, suggestions on that particular research and then being able to present to uh, uh, potential investors and getting them to know more about the potentials of clay in our, in our environment. I'll, at this point, live, uh, invite Harriet in to tell us a little more about our case study environment. That's our community from which we got the clay sample. So Harriet, Okay, thank you, Daniel. I hope everyone can hear me and good morning. Um, we picked the samples from Aluku, that's in the Western region, uh, in Enzima area, uh, which is near Telekubukazo. The area um, has a lot of deposits of white clay. I've known the area for more than three years, and it still actively has a lot of kaolin deposits that are still being mined and hauled to um, Takrade for put, um, it's, um, the material is being hauled to make ceramic white ware mostly. And yes, I think um, that's about it about the community. Most of the miners are just informal, as um, Daniel rightly said, the just um, bag the sands, the kaolin sand and um, clay, let me see that way, clay into 25 kg bags and sell them at five Ghana cities. So for the big trucks, they can get uh, approximately, approximately about 1,000 Ghana cities for each truck. And they are not interested in adding any clay until we had any um, engagement with them. They were just interested in hauling the material because they saw it as more profitable than doing any other thing. They were not even aware that they could add any form of value to it to make um create more employment in their area. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Yeah, so looking at uh, how underrated and undervalued the claim. Uh, mineral uh, the sector is in Ghana, we set out to establish uh, a, a local value chain for the clay industry. We also uh, decided to identify some of the challenges that are hindering the development of the industry. We want to identify the gaps in the local, that's the uh, skill, uh, skill wise and then the equipment as well. And we want to, we, we, we set out to develop strategies that can help us to actually unlock the potentials of this uh, uh, clay minerals that we have we have in the, in the country. Now, what we did as a team was that we actually decided to take inventory of 
uh, and and then uh, of this and then mapped this mining clay mining sites and then, then we that's how come we decided on the uh the the, the teleku uh, area um just a fun fact i through research found that that's actually the village where the one of our founding fathers was born that's Kwame Nkrumah actually that's just a fun fact and then so we also went on to did some sampling and tested uh we took some samples to the lab we did some literature review as well uh we also tried to assess the existing uh, clay uh, uh trade uh industry and supply chain how like harriet was saying how the people in the area sell their clay how much value is added and then we did a little bit of shareholder uh, engagement as well now by doing this um valuation and and and, and uh, uh, skill improving upon the skills and then uh, introducing the uh, locals to the new equipment that they can use with their mind and how much value they can add to the clay minerals before selling we have been able to identify that by so doing and by so by so doing and creating jobs for the individuals in the area we have been able to improve life by eliminating poverty because now they are able to add more value to their products before selling and get more money to cater for themselves and by so doing they are uh, there's less hunger in the in the area and because the most of this uh, people or most of these individuals engaged in this particular mining in that in that area are mostly women and uh, they are involved in in the in the um, in the unskilled part of 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 the work that's uh, just hauling or say carrying the clay to the market but by introducing the skills to to them they have now been integrated into part of the let me say technical aspect and by so doing this has also created a decent working environment for all individuals involved and as well by evaluation we also noticed that although we have a lot in abundance and we like we stated earlier that this clay minerals are abundant in the country but we have not been able to tap so much into it by bringing these things to light we're able to create responsible consumption and production um, in, in in the country and uh i'll hand over to harriet again to take us through our budget and then the rest of, of the presentation harriet please thank you daniel so um in able to look at this project in more detail, um, we envision that a budget um, of this nature is going to support our work. Um, as we have realized, there's going to be a whole lot of stakeholder engagement in order to unlock the value of clay in the minds of these people who are already just used to hauling of their material, which also has diverse um, impacts on the environment going forward. Because if they've been mining this for let's say over 10 years, you can imagine the uh, vastness of the degradation. They are not even putting the area into any other use other than just mining the and hauling the clay materials out. In Ghana, customarily, uh, before you can go and speak to even a chief to talk about any matter at all, you've got to, um, do I say grease palms? So not as a way of bribery, but it's a form of ketsi for us in our tradition. So we'd have to present um, monies to the traditional heads and the relevant parties at the place. And then we would also have to set up location for the sensitization um, workshops if we want to show investors, um, invite investors to the sitting meeting to evaluate their potential, let me say, um, host communities, then all of these things would have to be set up. 
in order for them to have a direct view of how things will go. And we would also have to do some more geological work as um, you'd see later, we gathered some samples, but those, um, those we only worked on three samples for now because of cost implications and then timing constraints. But we also need some of these um, field supplies to make um, the work go forward. So we've quoted the amounts in Ghana cities and USD equivalents just to make everybody have uh, an overall understanding of the budget. And then, yes, for the field personnel, um, we are looking at some small tokens for their labor. Excuse that, me, uh, Harriet, just to let you know, you have three minutes remaining. So I wanted to make sure you oh. could get through the rest of your slides. Oh, you're on. Uh, you're on mute. So uh, I think uh, somehow we got Sorry. you on mute. That's okay. So um, we've we worked with uh, according to our timeline, as I um, earlier, and preliminary engagement with. Um, yeah, I think community. you can skip the time. I think you can skip the timeline. So just go ahead. Yes, we we had discussions with a number of miners. And we found out from our analysis that the type of clay that's being mined is kaolin. And then the mode of operation for the people in Aluku or Teluku Bukazo is mainly to mine and then haul. And then they were selling um, the bags at five Ghana CDs, approximately $1 per 25 kg bag. And then most of the operations were illegal, but they were open to uh, legal formalization if it was possible. And from my investigations at the Takradi base where they've been shipping, should I, hauling the material, the um, material is mostly being used for white wear, that's um, tiles and, and, and bathroom products. Next slide. So um, we have three samples, as I said early on, and these are the results that we got. And this is the first sample. You can see the energy curve and then the results as in the elements and in their percentages. Next one. So yes, this for the second sample. And then the third sample, okay, okay. Yes, so we use the third sample as a control sample, so we didn't think it was relevant for us to put it into this result. But mostly what we gathered from this is that they were kaolin, um, because we could have had them being smectite, but the, the samples in that area are kaolin. So thank you very much for your time, and um, the whole team is looking forward to your questions, if you have any. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and it uh, looks like there's a lot of potential uh, and yeah, you've done some good work in identifying those uh, value added. Um, so is our, if there's, are there any questions uh, for the clay, for the clay group? Could you maybe uh, go into some details about the the difference between just the hauling compared to, oh, here's a question, um, Patrick. Um, Patrick wants to know, um, what is the land ownership system in Ghana and how can such ownership modalities affect the clay industry? Um, by the way, Patrick is from Uganda, so he's uh, one of your neighbors there. <laughs> right. So uh, mostly we have two uh, land tenure systems in Ghana. There is either a land is owned by a family or it is owned by a stool. So a stool means it's for the traditional authorities, it's vested in um, the traditional authorities. So then if it's a family land, it's just as the name says. So if you'd want to go and mine a land, you'd probably have to see the head of the family if it's a family land. But if it's a stool land, you have to go through processes and then see all the members of the stool for them to sign 
um, to sign a paper to give you the land. But usually they do not even give it for a long period of time. And um, the maximum number of years you can take a land for is 50 years and it will return to its original owner. Thank you. Okay, there's another question um, from uh, Dr. Tong Palan uh, about, she says, you've done some characterization and uh, basically, will you be able to continue with the project to, to get to the end product? Uh, uh, are you, do you plan to continue or do you, want, do you expect that, that a future group will do this or are you planning to, uh, to continue to, uh, to bring this, these, these value added products um, uh, to the market? So where, where, how do you see your group uh, continuing with this work or not? Well, working with a team, I think everybody is very much enthusiastic about this project, but we've been mostly constrained by finances and then, and then finding the right place to start up. Um, we've already had a hang on some investors and the team is willing to push it forward. But if we add some people from the next team, to, it would be fine. The, the more, the merrier. <laughs> and uh, she follows up. Uh... I have sort of a related question. How much uh, value added products, how many value added products are currently being made out of the KLN, if any? So is there already an existing industry at all or would this be entirely new? And I, you may have said that, but I missed it. Um, and then her question is, how do, what is the local government's view of the, uh, the use of this uh, KLN clay? Okay, so uh, taking your first question on if there's an existing industry, um, there isn't much, no. There aren't so many of them. The current government is, is making factories, one district, one factory, as I said uh, previously, but um, we haven't seen any such thing in the Teluku Bukazo area. There's only one in Takrade, where people hold the material. There's also a related site in Inchaban that's close to Takrade where they also pick more clay minerals to feed the very factory and the ones from Teleku Bokazo is going to. So yes, there's only one in the whole Takrade area and looking at the um, capacity of the deposit, the quantity, the volume, it's possible we could have a factory in Teleku Bokazo to house the whole manufacturing of whiteware in that area, because they have a, a massive deposit. And, and I'm sorry, yes, if, I may, if I may, uh, what what is happening in Ghana is that there's a lot of clay, but all the people who are engaged in this is it's, it's, it's more like an informal sector. So it's on small scale, and the products gotten like that we get from all of this are mostly our faces uh, for flower pots. And we call them flower pots and mostly just for local use uh, as in in-house use and all of that so there's no much to talk when it comes to the clay industry in, in ghana i think that that sort of answers the next question uh Canisia says how is the market structure with regard to the products which you i think you've just explained and then have you mapped other potential uses i think he, he means what are the uh, what are uh, what are the some of the the potential uses? What are some of the products uh, that could be made from this Kalen? Um. So continuing the the research is something we are looking forward to to unlock more of, of this. Uh, so far, I think the basic uses that we all know, like I just uh, said, uh, we more than for. Uh, the vases and uh, we have the ceramic industries that uh, that go on to do the tiles and, and, and so so many other uh, uh, products. But uh, currently there are other um, uh, innovations going on where uh, young engineers are mixing, are doing the plastic uh, uh, plastic recycling. That's uh, mixing the plastic with the clay for for bricks and and for. Uh, uh, construction uh, works in, in, in housing. So uh, I think when we take on this and do more of the research, we will have more uh, potential. I think you've uh, so answered the next question as well. Go ahead, uh, Harriet. 
no, I just wanted to add that roads are a big challenge in Ghana here. So then with this whole plastic recycling thing, maybe one of the major industries we'll be looking at will be the roads if this project um, goes any further. And uh, do you have any idea where, where you might find funding for this? Um, yeah, um, just one with a, with a project leader, Dr. Ishmael, so far. We haven't had any extensive engagement, so you know, maybe if you could lead us on to any Okay, I think we can talk about some um, maybe multilateral agencies that might be interested. So anyway, yeah. thank you very much. Um, uh, there are a lot of potential there. Um, yeah, there's one, one final question uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, Kinesia says, how well are you engaging the civic leaders in order to get buy-in uh, for developing the sector because political will is the key? So that was once again um, another another question about local government. I think. Yes. So uh, the the channel is quite cumbersome. When you want to do that, you from the grassroots level, you have to engage the locals when they move to the assembly. We call them assemblymen. They will now talk to the unit members. So in general, if if we have uh, all these assemblies agreeing with you, so far we started work. Now you're talking to the locals that the unit committee members, they are only representatives. Then we intend moving to the district or municipal level. Uh -huh. So it's it's more like a, a channel that we are going through. And uh, with uh, the current um, uh, policies of the current uh, government in power that they are, in, they are looking at establishing uh, one factory per every district or municipality, uh, we are very positive that uh, when we continue with the work, we'll be able to get to a level where the, these uh, locations or these areas where we have this abundance of clay get their the various uh, 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 factories as, as well. I think Noel and uh, Musa, who are also on our team, can, can uh, make their input. Hello. Yes, hello. I don't know if it's Yes, it's Noel. I don't know if you can get me. Yes, we hear you. Yeah, uh, I'm also part of the, the group, this group. So we actually, well, the, the project was most focused on Ghana, but I'm from Cameroon, so I actually also carry out some research here. I want to answer, give some answer for the question concerning the other potential of clay used, but here in Cameroon. So we, based on my research, I found out that the Clear is also used in the construction industry or bricks construction, and also in the cosmetic and the pharmaceutical industry. And actually we have a, a, some many cement manufacturing company that are looking also for clay for, for just cement. So in Cameroon and I, can, I think also in Ghana, the, the use of cement is very, very, uh, the potential use of cements are very, very huge and vast. So the project uh, objective is like to continue on working on the on this uh, clear potential to like make it uh, bring out the development of some local community. This is what I wanted to add. Yes, we'll uh, we'll hear about that in a few, uh, in one of the uh, later projects. They'll be talking about the use of kaolin for cement. So um, I see Musa, Musa has his hand up uh, also. Yeah, uh, thank you, Gary. Um, Nice meeting you again. Yeah, um, I'm also a member of the team as a mentor. And um, one of the um, objective of the project is to unlock the, um, the value or the potential of the clay, the contribution of the value of a clay to the economy and then security of a nation. So in a way of uh, um, getting the buy-in of the uh, politicians or the lawmakers per se is to because most of the countries of uh, I mean the of this region the the government play emphasis on another aspect of the economy like in Ghana they have a lot of uh, deposit of uh, diamond in Nigeria and um, petroleum so the emphasis is there but 
the extraction or the exploitation of uh, the clay mineral is mostly at the small scale. And the government did not realize, I mean, there's no much realization of the importance or the contribution of the industry to the economy. So by unveiling the potential of this uh, uh, value of the, of, of the clear minerals, that will gain the buy-in of the politicians, I mean, the lawmakers. So it's one of the, just to answer the question that how are we going to get the uh, buy-in of the uh, lawmakers. So by the unveiling, because the interest, the attention mostly are on the other sector of the economy, like the oil and other sectors, not realizing the contribution of this sector to the economy. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're running out of time, but uh, Professor uh, Shinje uh, has a question, so I'll turn it over uh, to her. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, well, what I I wanted to comment about the uh, the clay deposit, which I saw the kaolin and the value addition which can be made without, uh, to a certain extent, wasting this material, if, if I could say. Because if you see the whiteness of this kaolin, which is not that common, we have a lot of kaolin worldwide. But when I look at the whiteness of this kaolin, I can imagine the value, which as they mentioned in the uh, whiteware industry. So I was trying to find out, I mean, if uh, they have sun, and because uh, from what she said, the, the kaolin is sandy. So if you have your sun and the kaolin, which you crush, then you just need some felspatic material, which is as white, and then it could be back and exported. Why am I saying this? Because I mean, for quite some time, we're producing some white way in Cameroon and we're importing these raw materials from Europe. And I'm very convinced, I mean, the, the value addition is not that much, but this is not the sort of material that you waste in the cement industry. You definitely need to use it for the white wear industry. That is either white wear or for paper. So it's very high value material that I think a lot more interest should be put onto it. And if the industrialists, even in, the, in Europe, are aware of the quality of this clay, which from look, a look, I know it's of high quality, this material should be better used than you know, let it be used in, this, uh, in the building industry. That was just a comment I wanted to make, and I could appreciate you know, the value. And I think, I mean, even from here in Cameroon, we might participate in such a project. Ghana, I know uh, Gary was saying Uganda is close to, to Ghana, but I think it's quite a distance. Cameroon is closer to Ghana than Ghana. <laughs> Uganda. So I think, I mean, we, we I guess I like need some, uh, geog some geography lessons. Um, Anyway. Yeah, I laughed at, at that comment, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank so you. Think, uh, this is a very good industry. I think something could be done, you know, to give better value to it than what is actually happening. And uh, I'm convinced even if the government of Ghana, the stakeholders are more aware of what could be done with this clay, I think is very good value for money. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I think we, uh, we've we used up our time for this uh, group. We're going to get through everyone. So thank you very much for all your comments and questions. and. Uh, we will uh, move on to the, uh, the two groups from the Philippines that are working on transforming quarry waste. All right, am I, am I audible for everyone? Yes, we hear you. All right, so good day, ladies and gentlemen. We are grateful that you could all make it here today. My name is Agustin from Group One, and this is a joint project presentation uh, between two groups working independently but tackling the same problem. We will be presenting our project on transforming aggregate quarry tailings into valuable products. Today's presentation will cover the following parts. Under the guidance of our project leader, Dr. Ketung Palan, and through the consultations with our stakeholders, the groups have worked tirelessly these past a few weeks, and we look forward to sharing our outputs with you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Agusti. I'm Wiz from Group 2, and I'll be continuing the presentation. As our title suggests, we as two distinct groups intend to solve the same problem concerning wastes produced by quarries. Considering the amount of material produced by a quarry to meet the needs of the Philippine market for aggregates and dimension stones, the amount of byproduct wastes should not be just ignored. 
These tales, after collection and disposal, lay around neglected, besides the fact that it takes up potential productive space. In the long run, it may pose an environmental problem and to some extent some social risks when it undergoes erosion. Given this, with the help of our project leader, Dr. Tumpalan, we have partnered with two companies who have shared their interest in reducing their tails through aggregate production and the maximizing of its usage through the conversion into suitable viable products. Both quarries are located in the Rizal province here in the Philippines, and they have been extending assistance to the project members throughout this research. Each group worked independently with each of these companies, group one with MECBI and group two with PCPI. Uh, Majestic Earth Core Ventures Incorporated, or MECBI, is a 10-year-old company, and they allowed us to partner with their Rizal quarry primarily engaged in the extraction and marketing of aggregates and similar products, as well as the operation of um, some crushing plants. Meanwhile, Pacific Concrete Products Incorporated has been in business since 1969, and the Rizal Quarry branch um, with the same processes has entertained our requests for partnership. This project is within the common interest of both companies as they desire to contribute to the growth of their local communities and to national development by maximizing the potential of their operations, always keeping in mind that processes must always be sustainable. With this, we would also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors that made our work on this project possible. Now for context, the tails of both quarries are fines, that is um, sand to clay sized grains. These fines are the collection of undersized from all the processing, crushing, screening they do with the run of mine to produce marketable aggregates. As described earlier, um, this fine material has been deemed as waste awaiting no further use and the end of its life would be the dump site. In a nutshell, the goal of our project is to try and convert the, these precious wastes, locally called banlik, into a more useful material. So to help us achieve our goal, we set up these objectives. First is to characterize the waste samples found in each quarry. Second is to identify potential products suitable for the type of waste we have for each quarry given the specific characteristics. And afterwards is to create a replicable process design of extracting the waste material to its conversion as a valuable product. This could serve as a guide for the companies to follow if they wish to apply this project. Here are the specific steps we made. So this chart shows our methodology for this project. And as you can see, it is divided into three parts. For the preliminary stage, we established partnership with Quarry, which allowed us the gathering of information on their processes, practices, production, and profile. It also allowed us to send uh, members on site for visit for sample collection, samples in which we sent to different laboratories for analysis and characterization. Stage two, is when we match the result with existing studies to see what products were available as choices. Group one chose ceramic bricks as products, while group two pursued the use of tails as an additive to concrete block making as a sand substitute. The justification along with the formulated process flow will be discussed later in the results portion of the presentation. For the last step, it, is, it was mostly evaluating the process we designed together with our project leader for improvements and recommendations for future study. By future study, we mean the practical application of this conceptual design. Due to the limitation of pandemic protocols, the online setting, and the short time frame, we finished the project with the theoretical design as our final output. Although both groups worked independently, it is only natural that the methodology would look alike since the objectives for this project were the same. Apart from the general and specific objectives that we have identified, we aim to carry out the project with adherence to holistic and sustainable development by considering the relevant sustainable development goals of the UN. SDG 9, industry, innovation, and infrastructure will be addressed through the relevance of our valuable product as construction materials. The involved process flow to create such a product also provides room for innovation within the quarry industry. SDG 11, uh, sustainable cities and communities highlights the aspects of community involvement and employment opportunities that the project implementation will offer, as well as achieving a local circular economy and turning quarry waste into valuable products. SDG 12 
uh, responsible consumption and production becomes relevant with the project's focus on waste reduction and management in the quarry setting. We also have goals like SDG 8 and 17, which are indirectly covered due to the multidisciplinary aspect of our project. The bulk of the group's expenses consisted of the characterization, characterization tests like XRF, petrography, and soil index properties. But we also have uh, miscellaneous fees like transportation and deliveries. In total, both groups spent about 730 US dollars. Okay, uh, now we'll go to the uh, project results and output part of the presentation. So we, were, we will first look into um, the first company, uh, MECV or Majestic Earth Core Ventures Incorporated, located at Rodriguez Rizal, Philippines. The geology in the area or the lithologies associated are mostly basalt and diabase, in particular, hilo basalts of the Montalban of Yalite complex. The products of the company are sand and gravel ranging from 5 to 40 millimeters. So, as you can see here, you have here the uh, basalts. Um, uh, with their, uh, with, uh, at the end of the processing will be turned into uh, quarry waste. And uh, for this purpose of the project, it will be turned into a cement brick. Or uh, the idea behind for the valuable product would be cement brick. Next slide, please. So as, as mentioned earlier, um, we conducted several uh, experiments to characterize the quarry waste, such as particle size analysis, such as sieve analysis, uh, we did also determine some uh, the geochemical composition through X-ray flore uh, fluorescence spectrometry, and then uh, we identified the liquid limit, plasticity index, and moisture content, um, uh, including all the soil index properties. And from this, uh, from the characterization of the waste, um, we conduct uh, we conducted or proposed a process flow from extraction to the valuable product, which is cement bricks. And then we will we will have some recommendations. Next slide, please. So this slide basically just show you, shows you the partic particle size distribution of the four samples we collected. So from left to right, you will see the increasing siltation process. So sample one was collected from silt uh, siltation pond one to sample four, the siltation pond seven. So initially, the, um, uh, you can see the coarser uh, particle size uh, from the initial onset of the siltation. And uh, you will have increasing uh, um, percentages of uh, materials pass, uh, retained in, uh, in, in um, lower uh, seed sizes, uh, corresponding to silt or clay sizes. So this will be further um, supported by the uh, other geo geotechnical tests. Next slide, please. Now for the chemical properties, you have here um, a Harker diagram um, showing you the relationship of the silica uh, with the other major oxides. Um, like I said uh, from the previous slide, as you increase the saltation process, you also um, notice the decreasing particle size of uh, the tails. And uh, you also see the increasing uh, amounts of iron, aluminum, manganese, and magnesium. And um, comparing this to literature um, um, values for uh, materials used for cement bricks, such as uh, ground brick dust by Olofinade and others, um, this, uh, the ke chemical values um, closely um, are within the reach of the literature values. Uh, this has also some implications later, hopefully, for, for the mineralogical aspect of the quarry waste. Um, just a disclaimer, even though we wanted to conduct XRD experiments, we were not able to because of the situations here in the Philippines. So uh, next slide, please. So for the moisture content, um, we also see this trend of as you increase the siltation process or as you go move on from, uh, from a more siltation process, you also see the increase in moisture content or water content. So all of this um, 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 information, the increase in uh, iron, aluminum, manganese, magnesium, or uh, water content could possibly hit on a, on a mineralogy of ismectite and or kaolinite or other expansive place. Uh, on the clay, uh, on the quarry waste. So this has an implication on uh, on the cohesiveness of the uh, the potential product or the valuable product, since um, kaolinite in particular will merit a higher compressive strength for cement bricks. Um, now we go into the physical properties. Um, Heli. So for the physical properties, uh, we see two diagrams in terms of the plasticity index and the liquid limit. So as we do see in the relation of this uh, 
uh, figures, we can see that uh, the degree of plasticity uh, comes from the values of around medium to plastic, highly plastic, and some characteris characterization of having a clay soil and silt based on the sources of Kadir and Zhang, and also in the liquid, lim a liquid limit, uh, we do see some direct proportionality uh, within the versus the plasticity index uh, being presented. So based on the figures, as we see from Roy uh, from 2017, we see that the, ca the characterization of the tails would be either a silt clay to clay range. Likewise, with their degree of plasticity from medium to highly plastic, meaning that if you at least uh, consolidate this uh, material product, it would have some cohesiveness or the togetherness of the bond of the, the soil itself, giving it more strength and having the compaction being highly compressively strength. Next slide, please. So for the uh, process flow of the diagram, um, I will give you first the mining process to in extracting the the quarry is quarry stone itself. So we go first with the drill, blast, and load cycle, or within the mining process. Thus, uh, as we end in the mining process, we go to the run of mine ore, which is around a 0.5 meter range of uh, fragmentation. Thus, it would go to a hopper that goes to the primary crushing, which employs a jaw crusher. So in this one, it has a closed side setting of around three inches. Then it goes to a series of scalper screens. So it is uh, somewhat uh, uh, synonymous to a grizzly so that it would be screened. So um, the lesser three inches would be rejected already as uh, waste. And the greater than three inches uh, in, the, in size would report again to the cone crusher for further liberation. So after that, it would already it would have already a one inch size in uh, in particle size, and it goes to a double vibrate, vibrating screen. This double vibrating screen has uh, two compartments, so it has an upper uh, vibrating screen and lower vibrating screen, separating the one inch in particle size, which is uh, considered to be classified as a G1 stockpile. Likewise, the less than one inch going to the three-fourth uh, stockpile and sand. And during that one, uh, the course of the, the, the process, it would go again to a secondary vibrating screen. And it would have, again, a subproducts of three-fourth stockpiles and three-eight stockpiles. The lesser than three eight uh, inches would go to a spir spiral classifier, and it would, uh, for the correction of it, it would be at least it would be an S one stockpile, and goes for the tails. Um, next slide, please. So for the tails, it would be disposed. So it has uh, three uh, versions of uh, having a, a tailings storage uh, disposal. So it would be either a dry stack a storage facility which employs a slurry one, and also a backfill. Uh, for the Philippine mining setup, majority of our uh, tailings storage facility are being, being in a slurry type. Uh, thus, we need to dewater them by either a filter press or sand drying for if ever a, an absence of filter press is not present. Next, details to be added will or substitute sand by means of percentage in the cement mixture. Thus, it would go again to an optional uh, process flow that it would go to the performing of this slump test in the mixture based on the added tails percentage. This is essential because we need to identify the workability of the cement mixture prior to uh, mixing. So if it would fail, uh, we need to at least, again, have a trial and error pass it, uh, process. And if it passes, uh, it goes to the pouring of the mixture in a brick mold and cure it for uh, an interval of 7, 14, and 28 days. So next slide. 
So after that one, uh, we need to at least address to identify the compressive strength of the uh, cured brick by feeding it in, into a compressive strength machine for identification of its compressive str uh, strength. If it fails based on the certain standards, uh, we, we need again to retry for another set of a uh, mixture. And if it passes, it goes to the marketing product uh, which is uh, classified already as a recycled aggregate. Next slide, please. So after that one, we see that it is somewhat similar to the concept of our SDG uh, 12. So it is somewhat uh, synonymous to a circular economy. Thus, this uh, recycled aggregate, likewise with the uh, natural aggregate, will so, uh, have the demand in terms of buildings, uh, cons residentials, and commercial construction, likewise with the roads and bridges, or either uh, some of its uh, residuals would be either put as a landfill or being again recycled. The dissipative losses of air, water, and soils uh, would be at least uh, have some, there, some in place. For the recommendations, well, we need to conduct more geochemical and geotechnical and mineralogical tests, possibly te including temporal aspect. For particularly the mineralogical test, we need to at least identify the particle size and shape of the aggregate because it has a large factor in terms of the cohesiveness in the cement mixture. So secondly, the product testing for integrity. So we need to at least have a large set of samples in order to identify the optimum compressive strength needed for the product. Likewise, the improvement of the siltation process and stockpiling, the utilization of the product as materials for construction within the company site. Likewise, the utilization of valuable product as materials for livelihood program targeting the marginalized sectors which is also included in the company's uh, uh, corporate social responsibilities. Likewise, cost-benefit analysis of the product. Possibly this would be uh, partnered with some uh, cement companies or likewise with future stakeholders uh, having a pursuit of the research and also possible partnership with the local cement and construction companies. Good day, everyone. I am Luis, and I will be presenting the results and discussion for Group 2. For Pacific, the characterization tests done on the samples include X-ray fluorescence, particle size analysis, and soil index properties. Firstly, X-ray fluorescence analysis was conducted to determine the chemical composition in terms of competent oxide. From knowing the minerals present, environmental implications could be deduced when handling the material. It could be noted that the main components of the quarry finds are silica, alumina, iron oxide, calcium oxide, and magnesium oxide, which make up almost 90% of the bulk composition. This compositional data could be used in optimization studies for the mixture of materials. Next test was the particle size analysis, which was done to check the suitability of the waste as a sand replacement. The particle size distribution or PSD curve of the three samples was added to the PSD from the 2016 study of Adahar, which compares the PSD of sand and the urban lake samples. It shows that all samples from Pacific have more percentage of fine particles as compared to sand. Admixtures may be added to the mix since the specifications for fine aggregates for concrete from ASTMC 33 states that near 0.30 millimeters and below the aggregate can have workability, pumping, and bleeding problems. Additionally, based on the Indian Standard Soil Classification System, indicated at the bottom part of the graph, the samples could be categorized as silt or clay since more than 50% of the particles pass through the 70 micron or 200 mesh sieve. A particle size distribution curve was also plotted since it is crucial for creating a workable and cohesive concrete mix that can be thoroughly compacted without excessive mechanical effort. As the size of fine aggregates decreases, they may act as a lubricant, resulting in a higher workability. 
being more specific, fine aggregates passing through the 300 micron sieve size critically affects the workability of the mix and is generally preferred to a 20 to 40% of this fraction. Finally, the physical and geotechnical parameters of samples, that is the moisture content, pop density, and other brig limits consisting of liquid limit, plasticity index, and plasticity limit were analyzed. Other Berg limits defined the soil consistency and the percent moisture at which clays and silts pass from semi-solid into plastic and then into liquid states. Fine grain soils are classified using a plasticity chart wherein the plasticity index is plotted against the liquid limit. Based on the chart and the unified soil classification system, all three samples could be classified as low to medium plastic inorganic clay or CL. Materials with plasticity index greater than 10 are said to be cohesive soil. Dry strength increases with increasing plasticity and CLs are said to be soft and more crumbly. Thus, further studies need to be done to determine the strength of the material. From these data and from related literature, a schematic process flow was developed for block making and was tweaked accordingly to fit the company setting. Uh, hello everyone. So first, uh, we will look quickly at the quarrying operations of uh, Pacific and our proposed process flow for block making, which will start at the extraction of this. So here is an overview of the quarrying process. Uh, after several crushing and screening stages, the waste passes uh, a series of siltation plants. Uh, with excavators, the waste is brought to multiple drying beds once or twice a week to reduce the water content. So shown here is uh, our proposed process flow for concrete block making. Uh, the dried waste is then transferred to a stockpile. So at this point, uh, it is suggested to perform particle size analysis, uh, moisture content, and specific uh, gravity determination for quality control to ensure that the waste is still a viable substitute and necessary adjustments can be made for later stages in the process. Uh, concrete mixes are usually composed of sand, gravel, water, and cement. Uh, the addition of mixtures such as super plasticizers is recommended for concrete uh, mixes with finer aggregates to aid in workability. So the water can either be uh, sourced from the nearby ponds or recycled from the quarrying process. Uh, in order to foster community involvement, a manual block making process is recommended. So the concrete uh, can either be mixed with the shovel or using a concrete mixer. Uh, the conventional mold uh, produces a single block per cycle. Uh, however, there are manual block making machines capable of producing multiple blocks per cycle. Uh, then uh, compaction is done to reduce um, the voids and achieve the required density and compressive strength. Uh, the mold is then ejected and the blocks are subjected to curing. So for effective curing, it is suggested to cover the blocks uh, with the plastic sheet under uh, shade for a duration of at least seven days. Uh, the block should also be kept damp either by continuous spraying or submerging the blocks underwater. Uh, at this point, compressive strength testing is recommended uh, after curing for quality control. So the produced blocks can then be subsequently sold and used in local construction projects. Uh, since uh, the project output is only to give a conceptual process flow, an optimization study is recommended to ascertain the, uh, the concrete mix and curing conditions that will give the desired properties with the lowest cost of production. So it is also recommended uh, to evaluate the possible environmental risks associated with the block making process. So uh, other suggested tests are detailed in our final paper. So a feasibility study is also needed to determine the economic viability of incorporating the process in the operations of Pacific. So Pacific can also coordinate with their hollow block uh, department regarding the block making process. Uh, by turning the quarry waste into a valuable product, it would give additional uh, income for the company while uh, providing jobs for the community. So this can also address waste accumulation in the quarry. Uh, should PCPI uh, adopt the proposed process, the company can include it in their SDMP as a livelihood program for the residents. Um, this will be in accordance with, their with, with the objective of their SDMP 
to improve the capacity for personal skills development and generation of other sources of income for the community. Uh, Pacific can also coordinate with uh, local private and public bodies to further discuss uh, the impact and benefits for the community. So that's it for the Philippine project. Uh, thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a great uh, circular economy uh, project. And um, I wonder if the, uh, my question would be, are the companies uh, willing to continue working with you to, to, to further develop these products? And you mentioned that they had a uh, social um, uh, plan, the social development and management plan. Is that something voluntary or is that something mandatory uh, imposed by the government? I see one hand up. So um, yeah, go ahead and answer that and then we'll go to Nico. Uh, okay, um, uh, I'll answer for the first company. Um, so the, uh, the social development ma and management program is mandatory for all uh, um, extractive uh, uh, industries in, in the Philippines. So they need to come up uh, a portion of their income uh, uh, and uh, provide, uh, provide back to the com host communities. Um, so this, uh, uh, the two groups, I believe, have recommended that uh, the valuable products from, this, uh, from their quarry waste can be used as a livelihood program as part of, uh, in general, for their social development and management program. As for the, uh, uh, for the willingness of MECV or the first company, uh, Majestic Earth for Branches Incorporated, so we initially had a, a, a meeting with them uh, just this Monday. And uh, uh, they are very much willing to, um, to, to sustain this research. And in fact, uh, 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 they recommended a lot of tests or something, uh, the future tests, including the um, product, uh, uh, the compressive strength test or the design test for, for the uh, cement brick. And in particular, they also said that um, before the initial uh, of the research, uh, the initial um, bringing up of this kind of research to them, and, uh, as, as a company, they wanted, uh, they are already thinking of uh, uh, doing bricks or cement bricks as a valuable product for, the, for their waste. So the group and the company coincides with their uh, vision. I think uh, Dr. Tong Palan wanted to also uh, answer that question. No, yeah, I just wanted to add that we're actually working with uh, companies to do the um, the optimization because the two groups, what they have developed the conceptual flow. So our team actually is doing the optimization so that we can really produce um, the, the valuable product. And apart from the two products that the teams have developed, we um, were also proposing other valuable products that can be made up out of there. Ways. So yeah, our team is actually looking at um, these this kinds of um, research wherein we transform not just the waste from quarries, but also um, the waste from the from the other from the base metal concentrators, transform them into um, valuable products. So so yeah, that's that's kind of um, like part of the um, SDMP of all the of all the mining companies here in the Philippines. That's great. Uh, we love what you're doing. That's fantastic. Um, I, Raymond has a, um, a detailed question. Maybe you can uh, uh, say that rather than me reading it. I'm not sure that he wants to speak. Um, uh, his question is, um, for the enthusiasts of CE, not sure what he means, this is one of the imperatives and innovations needed in developing nations in order to safeguard opening of more quarry sites, but further requirement is determination of recovery if we are to reduce the building blocks. Is it possible to recrush rec and blending for safety, longevity, and sustainability when buildings or any infrastructures have been brought down or decommissioned. So I guess you're talking about reusing um, uh, build, uh, buildings that have been demolished. Got a CE is circular economy. Okay. Uh, who wants to answer that one?
Professor Tung, Tung Palan, maybe. Maybe Mamkit will have a better answer. Okay, I think I'm not sure if I understand correctly the question, no? but um, what we are doing in the optimization part is we really try to um, check also, because it's not just about the comp compressive strength, no? it's not just about the suitability in terms of the strength of the material, but also because that is a waste from, from mines, uh, we should also look at if it's really applicable to be used, let's say, for example, in construction. So there are tests like what we call the, um, the TCLP. That's when we determine whether there will be certain metals that will be leached. So uh, that will be leached. So we are looking at um, all the tests. So in our team, we actually have um, civil engineers whom we are working with to really test, you know, the. Um, the, the safety, it's not, uh, of course, the sustainability as well as the, the safety to use the, the valuable products. And um, part also of the optimization is to really look at what should be the kind of mixture that we will have to use and also um, the, the curing time so that it would really be um, suitable for, the, for its purpose. So I'm not sure if I um, answered correctly your, your question, um, Raymond. Ah, okay, now I got it. Um, I think you're asking whether we can reuse those, um, the building blocks. We, it's not yet in our, um, in our plan, but probably, yeah, we can, uh, we can look at that. I think you, we, it would be important that we look at that um, as one of the recommendations, but required to determine a lot of other factors within it. Safety is one of the things. And um, as an environmentalist enthusiast also, I am looking at we need to reduce on opening more lands for these other things if we can bring in the science that we go back into the quarry mm. sites and develop more materials for your reusability, reparation, and all that. That's when we'll be able to achieve the targets of the circular economy, and then we'll be excellent to move. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so uh, we actually have uh, Patrick has a question, and he's an engineer, so he's asking a, a technical question. So I'll let I'll let Patrick ask that one. Thank you very much, Gary, and thank you very much, Tim Philippine, for the fantastic presentation, and. Um, I have uh, two questions uh, for Group A. Uh, the first one is when you look at your utter bug limits test in terms of the plasticity index of sample four being 25.8%, uh, which is the highest of all the four samples. Uh, so the question is, did you carry out any modification, be it mechanical, chemical, or uh, mechanical, chemical to come up with the design mixes? for the, I mean, in the laboratory to determine the compressive strength of bricks. Uh, and then the second one is, um, what was the mix ratio of the cement bricks uh, from the quarry waste? And the, how different is it from the conventional, uh, conventional cement sand bricks? And uh, is it cost effective keeping the environmental advantage constant? Thank you very much, Gary. Um, okay, uh, I can answer maybe the first question, and I think if uh, Brianna is uh, here, uh, she can maybe answer for the ratio of uh, the cement bricks for the second question. For the first question, unfortunately, because of the time constraint of this research, uh, of this uh, project research and the situation here in the Philippines uh, in terms of the Omicron variant, uh, we would have would we would have wanted to conduct compressive strength. However, we we do not have the luxury of time. But however, as you as as we have mentioned earlier, it is part of the recommended um, test or experiments uh, along the way. In, that is also included in our process flow. Uh, to um, once we characterize the quarry waste, uh, we will uh, we will look at it, the, uh, their uh, compactionability or compaction. Uh, capacity or compressive strength. So, um, and then I believe, yeah, uh, from the initial um, consultation we had with the company, they are also um, interested in knowing this kind of information uh, about their quarry wastes. And as for the cement mixture ratio, uh, 
Okay. Um, um, okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, yes. Um, may I just uh, insert out regarding the uh, cement uh, water to cement ratio? Um, actually, this would be the dictating uh, parameter on how much uh, sand and how much uh, certain aggregates that you would put in the cement mixture. Uh, so far, uh, we would, so far what, what was presented earlier is a conceptual design on what we will do in case it would pursue to be a tangible project. So, so far now, uh, we need to at least uh, formulate by trial and error on what certain percentages would be the optimal uh, that would give a certain uh, optimal also in terms of compressive strength. Maybe I, I answered uh, partially your inquiry. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. And oh, can I add something? The can... the... Yes, please. Oh, sorry. I would like to add something to uh, what Heli mentioned. Uh, usually for cement, cement block making, uh, the sand portion is purchased, uh, is externally uh, bought from, is bought from an external source. That is what I wanted to say. So um, with the use of waste, which has no value, um, you can add it as an additive or replacement to the sand. As far as literature goes, we have found that uh, replacing uh, 75 to 85% of that sand, it, it could result into a good or a passable product. So that, that um, saves an expense since you don't have to purchase additional sand requirements. That may partially answer his second question about the uh, cost comparison. And so um, I don't know if, if anyone wanted to address that part of the question about the, the cost comparison. Uh, okay, so for, for cost comparison, definitely, uh, since we are just utilizing the quarry waste, uh, uh, the waste is not, um, uh, actually, it's uh, quite a concern for the, for, the, for the company. So it would be more uh, cost effective for them to utilize their quarry waste. And uh, for the cement mix, uh, cement uh, concrete or cement brick um, making, um, most of the materials will, uh, will be coming from, um, from the company itself, either from uh, it, it, either the sand portion of their products, or even uh, as as I as we have um, shown you, uh, part of their tails they have portion that is uh, also also within the sand size part, sand size particles. So um, um, some or if, if not majority of the materials required to create a, a cement bricks will be coming from their waste, and uh, the other would be um, those are the ones that uh, will be. Uh, uh, um, need to be bought uh, outside the company. And we actually raised this concern to the company, in particular Ma Majestic Earth Power Ventures Incorporated, and they are okay in this in, in this type of expense since they will be utilized, uh, they, uh, their quarry waste will be utilized because for the two years or two or three years that they have been operating, their waste were, was just being stockpiled. So right now, uh, they are now looking at something that, that, uh, that their waste can be utilized to something more. And in particular, again, they said uh, that uh, before the research uh, came in, they were thinking of um, uh, turning their uh, their ways to bricks already. So uh, our our research and our our our, our results further supported uh, their uh, their vision at that as in that aspect. And uh, uh, they also signify um, their intention of hopefully, if this becomes viable, uh, they would also utilize. Uh, this uh, this cement bricks in their uh, infrastructures within the company, at least uh, for the uh, no, for for paid pavements or uh, sidewalks or something like that within the company. This will be used um, um, until we uh, we came up with a very very viable product. Great, uh, thank you very much. I think that um, that's we have uh, used up our time for that. Uh, Lakshmi has a comment there in the in the chat. Um, I think that people can read. Uh, otherwise, we're going to take a five minute break, and then we have three groups uh, to finish off after the break. So uh, we'll, let's we'll come back uh, in about five minutes.
Thank you very much uh, for your presentation and uh, a great discussion. Thanks for all your questions. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back. We, uh, our next group is going to be the, um, the group from Cameroon working on uh, uh, development products, developing development of products from development minerals. That's a mouthful. So we have, uh, we have the Cameroon group, which was led by Professor Chinje with uh, team leader Patrick Lamunia. So if someone from the Cameroon group will take over and share your screen. Um, Okay, thank you, Gary. Thank you all for coming to this presentation. My name is Azio, I'm from Cameroon, and I'll be opening the presentation of our project titled Development Minerals for Autocliff Aerated Concrete Blocks, AAC, a case study for Cameroon, Madagascar, and Ethiopia. The project was supervised by Professor Ufi Chinje and assisted by Patrick and Ubre. Our presentation will be made following the preliminary section, our project results, and then the conclusion and recommendations. Autocliff irritated concretes are innovative building materials with great potential in the building material sector. The advantages over other building materials include lightweight, thermal and sound insulation, and consequent cost savings reasons for its wide use in Europe. Several development minerals such as sand, limestone, and pozzolana can be used in its manufacture, constituting up to 98% in the production formulation. Despite high housing deficits in Cameroon, Ethiopia, and Madagascar, several of these development minerals suitable for AAC are not valorized. In the search of innovative building materials to combat housing deficits in developing countries, AAC has been found to rate high as it combines mineral advantages in one material. The advent of this material will reduce shortages of building materials in these countries and consequently housing deficits. Therefore, providing information on AAC will increase awareness among stakeholders to invest for its development. It was our main objective in this project to provide relevant information for AAC production in the three countries using development minerals. To achieve this, we had to search and summarize scientific data on AAC production we had to identify the different development minerals in the countries. We had to collect relevant information on small scale production, as well as the cost in comparison with the traditional building block in the countries. Finally, we had to analyze the valorization of development minerals in AAC in light of the relevant SDGs. For the SDGs, AAC development will promote the achievement of SDG 9, 11, 12, and 13. For the project results, AAC are precancellular materials formed by aerating a cementitious mix followed by curing in an autoclave. The raw materials are sand or fly ash or other silica sources, lime, cement, and gypsum with a typical production formulation of 69 by 20 by 8 by 3, and aluminum in traces, and the water content maintained at 0.6. AAC is very versatile, can be used as blocks or as panels. The production line consists of raw material preparation, dosing and mixing, pre-curing, cutting and autoclaving. During the pre-curing stage, lime reacts with aluminum powder to produce hydrogen gas responsible for the expansion of the cementitious mix. While during the autoclaving stage, lime reacts with silicate to produce hydrated calcium silicate. A typical AAC block has a density of 0.6 and a compressive strength of 4.5 megapascals. The advantages of AAC over other building materials are numerous, including lightweight, versatile use, dimensional accuracy, good strength, and durability, amongst others. For Cameroon, the housing situation in Cameroon can be seen on photos A to D, which present typical houses constructed by the different income class in Cameroon. Housing deficits were about 1.5 million in 2013, mainly caused by urbanization and natural population growth. Permanent housing in Cameroon costs between 4 to 20 million for self-construction or 11 to 25 million for developer housing. Shortage in building materials has been identified as, has been identified as one of the underlying causes, underlying challenges to housing supply in Cameroon. Wall materials in Cameroon are mainly adobe bricks, ramped edge, cement blocks, and fired bricks. The table here presents the different building blocks used in Cameroon, their unit cost, and the cost per meter square. 
we may retain the cost of fire bricks 8,000 and for cement blocks 5,800 francs CIFA for <clears throat> comparison later on. <clears throat> Despite a dense network of former institutions responsible for housing supply in Cameroon, the informal sector is however dominant, supplying 70% of housing land, 97% of new houses, and 90% of housing finance. For the Derume minerals useful use for AAC production in Cameroon, sand, limestone, and puzzlan are the main materials, for example, shown in photos A, B, and C. As per the occurrence in the different regions in Cameroon, shown by the blue boxes on the Cameroon map, sand and stone powder can be observed in, can be obtained in all the regions in Cameroon, while limestone and puzzlan are more localized. The points indicated on the map are, are separate scientific papers characterizing these development mineral deposits as for their quality, as for their suitability for concrete applications. This shows some growing interest in the Roman minerals by the research community in Cameroon. For the feasibility of AAC production in Cameroon, it is worth noting that the Prime Ministerial Secular of 12 March 2007, promoting the use of local materials in public buildings, constitute a strong institutional support for AAC development in Cameroon. The various stakeholders for AAC develop for small scale production of AAC were identified and grouped under raw material suppliers, AAC block manufacturers, production machine suppliers, amongst others. Their status were analyzed, and a result showed that the feasibility of AAC production in Cameroon is similar to other traditional building blocks. However, however, no history and high initial investment associated with AAC, with AAC production constitute additional challenges. The production cost could not be estimated for Cameroon due to no previous activity. But laboratories home and abroad has been identified where test production can be carried out to estimate the cost as well as technological properties. For local laboratories, they will need some strengthening in terms of autoclaving equipment. Based on the literature, 20% cost savings could be realized using AAC block compared to fire bricks in India. A typical AAC block in India costs about 80 Indian rupees, which is equivalent to 650 francs CFA, and the cost per meter square is about 5,500 francs CFA, which is cheaper than fire bricks and cement blocks currently used in Cameroon. However, at this stage, it is difficult to tell whether AAC block, the unit cost of AAC block in Cameroon will be similar to that in India. At this stage, I will hand over to Gaste to present our results from Madagascar. Thank you, Ajivo, for giving me the flower. As per the last general census of, uh, uh, regarding the population and the housing of Madagascar, we have noticed that more than 70% of the Madagascar community lives in precarious houses, which regard the roof, the ground, and the flower. This is due mainly to the poor valorization of the developed minerals, the lack of effective housing policy, and the low purchasing power of the population. By developing the AAC, we hope that this can contribute mainly to resolve the housing deficit, which is the main focus of the Malagasy government, as now they are aiming, this year, they are aiming to build 10,000 social residence per year. This has started from last year and uh, this year. With the respect to the Sustainable Development Goal 11, which is the Sustainable Cities. Next, uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, as mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the autoclave aerated concrete blocks development is feasible for Madagascar with the full support from the various uh, stakeholders. This requires their involvement and their full collaboration, like the officials, uh, the companies, and the community and others. The result of our research shows that all raw materials are available locally uh, from the north to the west part of uh, Madagascar. We can find most of the raw material in the 23 regions of Madagascar. So the market is still available for those investor, potential investors. However, 
there are a few challenges like the non-existence of uh, the local AAC, AAC produ producer, the competition with the existing, uh, the local market of the traditional blocks and the lack of the, um, a good housing policy in Madagascar. Thus, the study requires, requires sorry, further research and times for an optimal results. That's all from Madagascar. Thank you. So I give the flower to my friend from Ethiopia. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Gaspe. Uh, when we see the housing situation in Ethiopia, there is a, a major housing deficit. It is close to 1.2 million. And the living standard of almost 70% of the population is looks like on, on the picture, which is on the uh, left, while on the right, uh, those two pictures are only represent the living standard of 30% of the population. Next slide, please. The major case for this housing deficit is uh, R5, but in terms of uh, uh, in terms of impact, the first and the major one is a land shortage and the wealth distribution, and uh, the second one is in country migration, which is initiated by uh, uh, unemployment and a cost of a house, which is due to the expansiveness of the construction material and uh, reliance on a cement uh, products only and ignorance of uh, development minerals. While the, there is also some impact due to the absence of uh, AAC technology. Next slide, please. Uh, while there is this much gap, there is a huge potential in terms of raw materials for the production of AAC. Uh, throughout the country, whether it is from uh, igneous or metamorphic or sedimentary basin, there is a possibility to produce uh, a silica or uh, limestone or uh, a gypsum in terms of uh, different terrains. In the, in the pictures, can we, uh, we can see that uh, from a volcanic ash or from silica sand or from a mine tailing, we can get a considerable amount of silica. Next slide, please. Um, though, uh, in comparison to the silica, limestone, and gypsum are localized, uh, the, there is a, a potential for them also. Um, when we evaluate the feasibility of AAC production in Ethiopia, there is a uh, an opportunity and a challenge. The opportunities are the presence of large demand for housing and the presence of raw material, which is easily accessible and high quality. The challenges are uh, especially the initial capital. When we see the cost of this uh, machinery, which will be used for the production of AAC, it's close to 25 million in Ethiopians. Per, uh, uh, so that is very expensive. Some challenges will be uh, related to the lack of awareness, and uh, it will be uh, there will be a problem in terms of uh, plant suppliers and skilled manpower. And the other uh, problem will be related to the co-occurrence of these raw materials, since they cannot be transported for long distance. Next slide, please. Uh, to make this project successful, there should be an involvement and a cooperation between the government and the non-government corporates or uh, organizations. And there will be also a facilitation in terms of researches from research institutions like a geological survey and uh, universities. Next slide, please. When we conclude our work, we evaluated and understood that there is no a cultural history or research or production or use of AAC in Cameroon, Madagascar, and Ethiopia, despite there is uh, almost a century experience in Europe and later in Asia and America and in some African countries. There is a huge potential for production of AAC in these three countries. And 
there is uh, understanding about uh, AAC in institutional frameworks, but the technology is not understood. Uh, the production cost could be uh, comparable or even cheaper than the traditional building blocks. And the valorization of development minerals in AAC blocks in these three countries is possible innovation for meeting the sustainable development goals 9, 11, and 12, and 30. And we recommended a further research for characterization of some development minerals for AAC and find a best formulation in terms of quality and cost and elaboration of AAC technical sheet and evaluation of a construction cost using AAC blocks in three countries. Next slide, please. Based on our work, our recommendations are the following and uh, creating awareness of AAC technologies through a, a vulgarization of a present, present information and include AAC among the research and valorization program initiated by the government institution, which are responsible for valorization of development minerals, strengthen the capacity of local laboratories for the production and testing of of AAC in order to find a better formulation that meets technical quality and cost effectiveness. Carry out a detailed feasibility study using bottom to top approach for AAC development. This can be done by the public research institutions. Next slide, please. And uh, increase the funding opportunity for research, pilot production, and construction trials in field of development minerals, facilitate investment in field of AAC by incentive policies for importation of AAC, encourage the local production of AAC manufacturing equipment and encouragement uh, uh, for a partnership and a collaboration with abroad for a technology uh, transport. Uh, transfer and technical assistance. And finally, we want to say thanks for UNESCO for arranging this program. And we want to say thanks for uh, our um, our <coughs> leader, uh, Professor Ufi and assistant leader, uh, Patrick. And uh, we want to say uh, thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. That was very comprehensive uh, and uh, it looks like you have identified uh, all the raw materials um, needed in, in those three countries. So well done. Um, are there any questions for the uh, autoclave air aerated concrete group? Oh, we have a hand up. Uh, Professor Chinje, go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Gary, and uh, everybody listening. Well, I'm just uh, adding, you know, some very minimal comment to or maybe lay more emphasis to what my team has just uh, presented, uh, which I congratulate them for the work they've been doing, uh, especially knowing that the AAC material is, I mean, the studies is totally new, you know, in some aspect which uh, we just brought in. And this was largely because, I mean, you heard about uh, Cameroon, the uh, Lord or the circular of the prime minister that was requesting that local materials be used in state pro projects, which were I mean, most of the projects expected to be built by the state. But unfortunately, it limits it to just three floors. Why? Because of the weight of the current materials which we have, which they named the uh, cement blocks, uh, fired bridge, stabilized earth blocks. So it gives more reason why we need the AAC that, you know, because of the likeness, we can go. That's why we have in, and they have they presented a, the example of a house in a building in Mexico, where we can do high rise buildings because uh, we know to be able to really solve the housing needs of the population, you need to move to high rise buildings. And of course, the possibility of using panels. So as they reiterated, we really need uh, partnerships. I know we're really trying to identify, you know, through this work they've been doing, some partners we can have to be able to do the testing to get up to a, a point where we can convince the government. And uh, from their studies, we realized, well, maybe there are very few African countries which they've not been able to identify that use this material. The potentials are huge. 
in uh, Madagascar, he just talked of a 10,000 uh, 10, buildings project of the state. We had a similar situation in Cameroon, and uh, it's been going on for more than 10 years, and we've not arrived at the 10,000 because of the slow, you know, the number of buildings you can put a block on top of the other. So, I mean, this is just adding the potentials of the AAC product and, uh, you know, to everybody who is listening, what assistance we can have would be very good. And I'm sure once this is done, it will not only be useful for Cameroon, Madagascar, and uh, Ethiopia, but it should be able to go beyond to the other African countries, especially, I mean, from their studies, they realize in uh, the developed world, these materials have been going on for tens of years. I think, I mean, I learned they talked of more than 50 years, but unfortunately, it's not been able to come down to the developing countries, but it's a material with huge, huge potentials. So, I mean, I just felt I should add this comment to what my able team has presented. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any any additional questions? I think uh, having no further questions, I think we'll uh, we'll proceed to the to the next group. The next group is. Um, the use of waste uh, in building materials uh, in India, which was with uh, Dr. Shuman Mehti. So maybe we could have the India group go next. All right, good morning, everybody. Please, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can see it and we can see and we can hear you. All right, thank you. So um, once one, this is group nine, um, just to precise that, we had um, three topics to work on. We had to choose one. So use of waste was one of them. Limestone carcination was the other one. Um, so we had to sw switch from use of waste for cement production to um, limestone carcin clay cement production. So we modified the topic and worked on this current project, which I'm about presenting. So this is group nine. And um, a group is made up of Dr. Meiti and myself, Ndape and John Blaze from Cameroon. We also have Jacinta, who is an engineer from um, Kenya. And we have Raymond Katabaka, who is from the University of Makerere, Uganda. Uh, our project outline or presentation is going to follow this uh, format. And now we're going to start with our problem, uh, problem statement. So. Uh, within the past um, decades, it's been observed that climate change has taken the place of priority, and it's a global concern. And we believe global institutions and stakeholders are putting efforts through different sectors to see how to curb carbon emission, especially um, CO2 emissions. However, uh, based on statistics that have been generated over the years, it's been realized that the energy sector is one of the main sectors where uh, carbon emissions that are having the highest percentages. So within that context, it was also observed that cement um, production processes generate huge amount of carbon dioxide, uh, especially if you can look at uh, this, this picture, the, the pie chart to the right, realize that cement production is almost 7% globally. It contributes that amount of CO2 emissions. So within um, this context of reducing CO2 emissions, uh, the, the pertinent question for the past few years has been how can we therefore reduce emissions of CO2 in cement production? And way back 2004, research started on, on this topic of calcined clay uh, for cement production. And uh, in 2014, based on the history I, 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 I read, it was realized that um, low carbon cement could be produced by effectively substituting for clinker because clinker is considered as a main source of, uh, of, 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 of CO2 in cement production. So our, our project is focused therefore on how to carry on um, cement production at the same time, reducing um, the carbon emission and then also making it sustainable for the environment and enforcing the various um, climate change mitigative uh, measures. So um, yeah, I would just like to present briefly at the, at, the, at the upper <clears throat> part of the diagram, you see countries that are huge consumers for, for cement and lower we realize that the methods or the technologies or the, 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 the measures that are being put in place to lower carbon emission. First, yes, we know innovation and technology is taking a, a major 
um, plays in carbon reduction uh, and strategies, but the substitution of clinker has taken a second place of priority. So it becomes a big issue when government starts um, focusing on reducing clinker so as to reduce the amount of carbon emissions. So this project concept, like Elia mentioned, is therefore based on the fact that clinker is the main source of CO2 in carbon in cement production. I mean, it contributes up to 50% at least 50% of the CO2 emission is through some come from the thermal burning that's a heat generation, and then others come from other sources. And if we look at normal or ordinary Portland cement production, Klinka constituted initially 95% of the, 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 the raw materials used for, for cement production. Gypsum was just 5%. However, questions have been coming up there for which other materials can substitute for Klinka, which will be environmentally ecological and which will have the same efficiency in terms of cement strength, in terms of cement um, capacity and utility. So various materials have been proposed, calcium clay, slag, fly ash, and natural pozzolana. These are the various materials that have been proposed. But in later years, it was realized that clay or, or, or clay rich in kaolin could be more readily available compared to these other materials. And that was where the low carbon the low carbon cement or limestone calcined clay cement was introduced or prioritized because looking at this cement, how is it or what is its composition? It's just essentially reducing clinker from 95% to 50% and substituting clinker with limestone that's crushed raw limestone and calcinated clay. So that is actually what we call the LC3 cement. <clears throat> when we look at this, um, this, um, this histogram that shows the substitution for different kind of materials that are used for cement production is true. Uh, I'm sorry, the different kind of materials for cement production, fly ash and other materials have been used. And you see the, the this color, which is brown, initially is for other. So lime uh, clay is not yet mentioned here, but clay later on in, in research from 2014 took the major um, place for, for substitution for, for clinker. So, uh, we had so many project objectives, identification of clear characterization, and this you should remember is for three countries, Cameroon, Uganda, and Kenya. So we had these objectives and to see finally in one of our objectives was to evaluate the ecological and economic advantages for the use of clay in cement production. So we had a, a, a stringent timeline and we did our best to accomplish most of the tasks. And what were there for the methods? So the first method was desk study, where we gathered um, pre-existing data, for Cameroon, Uganda, and Kenya. We also did um, introduce questionnaire to various cement companies and um, we re related to them and we, we generated data as much as we could. Some of the data was analyzed and then conclusions were made. Also, um, field work was done, uh, particularly in Cameroon, uh, um, where some uh, clay sites were visited and this is just an example of um, some of the sites that are visited in Cameroon. You have well in, um, in, 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 in Upper Senegal Division of Cameroon, and then you also have um, in the Mungo Division to the, to the right, where we visited a clay site in Banga. So how does this project attain the sustainable development goals? So the first thing it meets up exactly with the climate change action, reducing clinker to 50% actually reduces the emissions that are generated from cement production to at least 40%. And then it's industrial innovation. I mean, modifying the, the, the introducing a new kin that calcinates um, clay brings in a new um, uh, introduction to the, the, the system of the, in, of the industry. So other goals have been attained, including uh, sustainable cities, good health and all of that. So what were the projects output? I just wish to precise that uh, the first thing was we, we, we generated a database for Cameroon, for Uganda, and for, for Kenya, where we could actually local, lo locate clays that were rich at least in 40% of uh, a cow lean. So there's an existing database now that's based on this project where we know sites. Uh, in Cameroon, there are more than 30 sites added to the information that was sent to us. And I wish to precise that most of the information we, we got our, our project leader, Dr. Miti, did um, provide them for us. And then we also added some other information from other sources. So there's a database now that is existing for these countries 
on the location of, uh, of clays that can be used effectively to substitute for clinker. This is just an example of um, a database for what was done in Cameroon. And then uh, there is also uh, one major output was the fact that we realized that most of the clays were just 30 kilometers from the, 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 the various cement factories. So not very far as maybe initially were thought by some of the cement companies because some of them had information about clay calcination that they always had the fear that it could be far from the cement factories. So based on our work, it was realized that most of the clays were not far from the cement factories. This is um, a map, an example of a map. This map is not completed yet. It's just uh, a, a, an example. There's a, a, a bigger map that is on the way where we shows the location of clays in Cameroon as clays with, which, which are rich in cowling and which are suitable for cement production, their location. And then also um, the black dot signifies um, the main city of Douala in Cameroon where you have all the six uh, cement producing companies. So you look around and realize that the clay deposits are not very far from the, the factory site. This is also a map for, for Kenya and is the same scenario for Kenya. The, the clay deposits not far from major towns where the cement factories are found. And then you have also this same map for Uganda, the same scenario. So this was uh, one of the major results that came from this project. Also, we, we realized that um, the annual production for cement in each country, Cameroon was stopping as uh, 2020 with 10 million tons per year. Um, Uganda followed and um, Kenya followed. And our precise in Cameroon, it's uh, the Pozolan Portland cement that's Pozolan that substitute for a good quantity of, of clinker, but not as casting clay would have substituted for, which is the main cement for using Cameroon. So also from the field observations which I made in the which I made, I realized that the clay is just like a previous group had presented, were very whitish, they were they were they were rich in cowling, you could feel it, you could observe it. I mean, from visual observations. It, it was very easy as a judge for me to conclude that at least 40% of these plays were, were rich in cowling. And um, these are just examples. And to, 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 to maybe um, indicate to others that clay is actually just heated to up to 800 degrees Celsius for it to be unstable and then combined with the other materials to make cement. So instead of heating um, essentially clinker to uh, maybe 1,500 degrees Celsius, now you have energy reduction. You, you, you profit also in energy when you're using um, calcium clay. And then um, within the context of this project also, we, we had a, a wonderful result in, with collab in collaborating with the various um, institutions and um, established professional ties with the cement factories in all three counties, which the, most of the cement companies are very, very interested in this calcium clay. And we established a financial document which, uh, depicts the profitability of LC3 cement. I, I wish to precise that using LC3 uh, makes you, that's, it doubles, it, it has a minimum profit of double of your, the minimum possibility to double the profit of the cement production. And also we established um, wonderful relationship with um, um, possible funders like GIZ who is promising to fund the LC3 cement in, in Cameroon. We, we just concluded a meeting a um, few days ago with um, the, the G. As the leaders of Germany, and they are very interested because this is a project that is ecological and meets up with the climate change target. Uh, so, just to precise again, one of the results is that initially it was thought that um, LC3 cement could only be profitable if the sites are within the, the scope of 30 kilometers from the cement factories. But when we did the financial analysis, we realized that even if the sites are 200 kilometers away um, from the, the cement factories, there is still a very good possibility for, for profitability after doing the project valuations, after doing the, the various uh, scenarios, uh, scenario simulations, economic and financial scenario simulations, we had three economic and financial scenario simulations which were simulated, we realized that it could always be profitable even up to 200 kilometers from the cement factory. So what are the advantages? First, LCTV cement is a very ecological, it meets up climate change targets with the priority. There's a very high chance of double profitability. Um, the cement strength, which is usually attained for maybe Puzzolana, uh, Portland cement within 14 to 21 days or 28 days, this same cement strength is attained with the LCTV cement within three to seven days. And then 
clay is readily available. I, initially, we, we thought that maybe Puzulana and other materials were more available, but after looking at the map and the data that we have, we realized even in Cameroon that clay is more readily available as compared to um, other materials that could be used for substitution as, uh, as maybe Puzulana. And then um, the same, we have, we have same durability of concrete and yet at a cheaper price. So based on the, the I, I already mentioned this earlier that the, 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 the advantage is that even at 200 kilometers from the factory, companies can still make profit. So what are the recommendations and the way forward? So the first thing is there is an urgent need for standardization and detailed feasibility studies. Yes, we have identified the, 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 the sites. Yes, we know a little about the extent of which um, these, these clay deposits can have but there is a need for standardization, especially if LCTV has to come to play in countries like in Cameroon, Uganda, or Kenya, there's a need for standardization. And GIZ is very willing to bring in its partnership on this, uh, in this regard. And then also we have to give priority for LCTV, cognizance of the fact that it plays a major role in climate change fight. So I think government institutions have to prioritize it. And also, um, cement companies are in dire need of technical capacity. In fact, within our, our, our meetings with them, it was realized that most of them don't know how to go about um, the usage or how to combine, uh, how to generate, or to, how to produce the LCTV cement. So research and development is very necessary for them. And so that is one of the things that the cement companies need and also need funding for modification of their uh, technical infrastructure. Um, so. Also, concrete terms have to be made to conclude the negotiations that were done in, with GIZ in Cameroon. Uh, Dr. Meti is doing a great job on this in this regard. Um, I think the terms of references for the, the project, which will maybe start up in Cameroon very soon, have been elaborated um, presently based on the conclusions of our last meetings. And also, uh, we recommend that exploration, more detailed exploration be done to location to, for the location of other limestone deposits in Cameroon. Yes, in the north of Cameroon, there is um, limestone at Figil. Yes, in the south region, there are now other limestone deposits that are identified, even part of the southwest. But in as much as LCT requires limestone to be added, there is a need also not just to look for the clay, but also to look for additional limestone deposits. And for future research, we recommend students to, the future students need to work on the characterization in terms of geotechnical characterization, uh, mineralog mineralogical characterization and analysis of this clay, and also to effectively quantify um, what we, 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 we consider, be it in Cameroon or in uh, Uganda or in Kenya, the amount of clay that could be, that, that, that is available in terms of research and reserve uh, evaluation. So we had a few challenges. The first one was having access to the cement factories. It wasn't easy. Uh, for those of us, for some of us work with the government, they had to take influence from other institutions for us to have access. And then even some government institutions had um, challenges giving us um, access to data. And then the, also the, the unwillingness, most, this is a major issue because imagine a cement plant that has established it, 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 its plant on, running without uh, another kiln for LCT. So you introducing an additional kiln in your cement production um, brings in a whole um, a, a whole change that's a, a total change modification in their cement production and for Cameroon particularly most of the cement companies are in this year 2022 based on the feedback we got uh, in the process of extension so this is the ideal time if we have to introduce LCT cement so that while they are extending they can easily incorporate uh, modification and also the government is not really aware not just for Cameroon but in all the other stakeholder countries Uganda Kenya most of the government um, um, key uh, stakeholders are not aware of the, 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 the importance of LCT treatment, its, it's ecological role, it's, it, its role in climate change and all of that. And you know why we should now maybe leave uh, a bit of Puzulan and focus on clay and other things. So uh, I would just want to therefore conclude by saying that yes, substitution for other materials like Puzulana and, and fly ash and other materials is good, but the results obtained from LCT with cement are unmatchable. You can't have the same result with, 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 with Puzolana. You can't have it with, with fly ash or mine waste. So on this regard, I want to thank um, Raymond from Uganda. I want to thank Jacinta from Kenya for their input. And we, we really appreciate Dr. Meiji for his input. It has been an immense time working with him. 
It was a wonderful privilege, and particularly for the role he's playing right now for the concretization of the possible project of LCT cement in Cameroon. So thank you so much for your kind attention. That was for group nine. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Blaze. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you said that uh, it was concretization. I don't think he, uh, the pun was intended. Um, so I congratulate you on uh, uh, moving forward with possibly getting uh, getting some funding to do to do this uh, this project. So congratulations on that. Any any questions for this group? So uh, Harriet has a group uh, has a question. What grade of cement are you targeting with the LC three? Okay, so um, presently the that question is going to be answered in a complex form because it's going to be on the priority of the cement companies. The same um, grade of cement, be it 4.2, 3.2, that is produced by uh, using Puzolana is still going to be produced using the LC3 um, cement. However, it's going to be market demand, is going to be company priority, um, priority that is going to decide on the grade of cement. So that question, it's, it's based on the company's politics for, for that decision to be made. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Prof Professor Chinje has a question. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, well, I'm uh, very interested in the work which Blaze well and uh, under Mighty Abdondia studies, but I just want to call an at attention to the fact that uh, all the cement co companies that are in Douala, which he made reference to, they don't really produce cement in Cameroon. They import clinker, crush the clinker, and that's why essentially they add pozolan to do pozolanic cement. Mm -hmm. There is one factory that produces cement, and that is at Figil. And because they have clay, they have limestone, and they, those are the two primary materials you need for clinker. I know they two go through clinker, which shows that the studies which uh, the team has done, where they could have the best impact would be working with uh, at Figil because there they have clay, as I said earlier, and they have the limestone. I don't know what percentage the clay has. I know he talks about at least 40% of, uh, of kaolin in the clay, but it's very, very, I mean, interesting if they could get in touch with uh, the cement factory at Figil. We know even uh, about some three months ago, the prime minister uh, uh, innovated uh, another uh, production line, you know, at uh, Figil, so it's uh, very important for them to get in touch with Figil. That's where they can have a faster impact of what they're doing because, uh, as I said, they do have the clay and they are the only factory in Cameroon that produces a clinker. The others import clinker, crush the clinker, and that's why they can only add limestone, uh, sorry, pozzolanic material. If uh, there is a clay that is identified, I know they've identified the right quality clay at the base, well, maybe then instead of putting the pozzolanic material, they can only add the, 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 the they can only add this material they produce. But as he says, it's a very big investment because they now have to do the real uh, production, even if it's 800 degrees centigrade to uh, produce a uh, metacaulin, which uh, replaces the pozzolan. Uh, it might be cheaper, but the important thing which I advise them to do is to communicate with uh, the factory in, at Figil. I mean, if they need help, I think we should be able to help them to get to that link. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that suggestion. Could I just follow up one minute? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Professor Chinje. Exactly. We have um, established um, contacts with um, these cement companies, particularly Cementcom. Um, we we had we we contacted them. We didn't have a successful meeting last week, but we got feedback from the responsible. Um, Personnel that they were very interested. So, however, the the project also is true. The, the the clinker is imported, but we are focusing on how profitable. Even if the clinker is imported, you reducing your clinker from maybe seventy percent if you're using Puzzolana to fifty percent. That twenty percent margin is huge profit, even if the clinker is imported. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is uh, we are also targeting cement uh, cement cam, which is the company you mentioned, as one of the key partners. 
for this project. So definitely we are going to get back to you and to other stakeholders who are going to be able to play a major role in making this, uh, this project um, successful. So thank you very much, Dr. Professor uh, Chinjian Afan. Okay, um, Harriet has a question. Uh, she's, she's asking, based on results, uh, what uh, use, how would you use it in construction uh, for what materials? I assume it, it's used for the same, anything that, con that cement is used for. She's mm -hmm. asking, is it used for foundation blocks or rendering? And I assume Everything. it's for the, all the same things. Exactly. It's, it's for the same thing, Gary, for, for whatever cement, Portland cement is used for, whatever Portland cement is used for, it's the same thing with um, calcine clay um, cement. It's just the same. I know from looking at some of the data that the uh, the um, the structural characteristics are 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 fairly equivalent. Uh, you mentioned that it has a shorter um, uh, setup, has a shorter setup time, um, curing time. But from what I've seen, the the strength characteristics are very similar to to uh, uh, ordinary Portland cement. Yeah, I, I could add up something, Gary. I don't know if Dr. Meiti is present, but we uh, in our last um, Zoom conversation before this presentation, he gave us. Um, we are presently doing a test in um, in India. So they have essentially built, um, I think, a, a building in the ocean with the LC3 cement. So this building has been under observation for the past six months. It has not crumbled inside the ocean. Whereas <laughs> if it was done with Portland cement within three weeks, due to the influence of salt, it would have crumbled. So it tells you the strength, it tells you the resistance. So they have been observing that for the past uh, six months. So this was a wonderful testimony on the, the quality or strength of feedback that you can get from LC3 cement. That was what um, Dr. Mezi told us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mezi is actually not uh, with us today, but be because we're also working on LC3, um, I happen to know that they have a, a one of the characteristics is the, is the, uh, sodi is the sodium chloride intrusion, uh, because mm -hmm. a lot of uh, concrete is made with, uh, with rebar, reinforced, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, iron mm -hmm. bars, iron bars, and it, if the salt gets in, then those that um, that iron is going to rust really quickly. But apparently, the the uh, LC3 has greater resistance to the intrusion of salt than uh, than ordinary Portland cement does. So that's another advantage uh, of the LC3. Uh, okay, another hand. We have uh, Azewo. Yes, thank you, Gary. I just want to mention that for future research especially when it comes to raw materials for cement. Uh, there could be some work done on the extraction of these raw materials because uh, there was some work was done in the south of Cameroon where huge limestone deposit was found in Mintong. And it was said by the, I think it was the general manager of the, in charge of geologic uh, exploration that it could considerably, it could actually reduce the cost of cement but when uh, the Dangute company started doing some feasibility studies, they said it could not be exploited due to uh, the injury that flooded you know, a majority of the deposit. So sometimes we really have to look at the, how feasible it is to extract some of these deposits. And I think uh, much is spoken about the raw materials, but there's really a gap in the feasibility of exploiting these deposits because as for now, it's like there's no way for that for the injured deposit, which initially was uh, huge. That's the minimum deposit, sorry. Just wanted to make that comment. Okay, thank you. And uh, we need, uh, we have 20 minutes left for the final group. So I wanna, I wanna just end there and um, thank you very much. Uh, looks like you're uh, making good progress. So uh, we'll uh, go on to the final group, which is the, um, the sand mining problem in Zambia. And uh, that will be our last uh, presentation for the day. Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, first, thanks for all to be here. Here is uh, Unza Milena from Group 11. Our project, our project lead by Dr. Wilson Mondura will talk about the, the problem of illegal sand mining in Zambia with the case to the Lusaka. As a problem statement, we, we have seen that the continued growing of population in Zambia, and which is, which is the same case in most of developing countries, is actually requiring a massive infrastructure, infrastructure development. 
not only in terms of house construction, but also road infrastructure and all, and all, all needs for urbanization. And this infrastructure construction will, will need and heavily rely on raw materials such as sands and gravel, which, causes an, which, which is causing an increase on the demand for these materials. In Zambia, sand is mined from riverbeds and close to the sockets, it's, it's, it's extracted from the southern pro, uh, province, mainly driven by illegal sand miners, which over the last decades have affected the riverbed by changing, his, the, uh, by changing the river course, eroding the riverbanks, and widening the river channel. And with this project, we want to tackle the challenge of sand mining riverbeds in South Lusaka by developing smart policies to bring a sound, a sound scientific, a scientific based solution to, to, uh, to address the problems. Our project concept is to identify, discover the problem, examine the process, its effect and impact with regards to set, uh, a set identification and mapping, then doing uh, estimation of resource quantity of sand extracted, uh, but also by investigating on the gender issues and environmental degradation. To discuss the project, we've, uh, we've, we've mainly made an assessment of the volume of sand extracted from a Kafka River tri tributary in Chikakanta district. And we've also done some investigation to determine the gender participation on sand mining and related issues, and also investigation on environmental damage that, that are observ observable from sites. And through this inform information, then we, we, we try to determine some solution for the overall problem, but also to propose some achievable and context suitable solution to address the issues. Regarding the SDGs, by looking for solution to the sand mining, mostly driven by artisan and small scale miners, we want to address uh, to contribute to the to the SDG SDG goals one, no poverty. While artisan and small scale miners can develop their future in a more sustainable way, and then support a sustainable livelihood, family livelihood. We also want to address to the SDG four and by enforcing regulation, we want to, to tackle the part, children participation in sand mining and contribute to gender equality with formalization and, and promoting association to, to develop a more structured business, business model where women can have better participation and own a, a, some position where they can strengthen the sector of sand exploitation. And lastly, by the SDG 9, we want to make the sand mining in Zambia, even it's, it's operated by small scale miners to contribute to the national economy growth and being considered as, as a part of a uh, development strategy of the country. As a, as a project output, through our certification and mapping, we we, we, we have worked around the, a, a, a cafeway tributary in, 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 the, in the site called Nasenga, in the Yucatan district. The river there arrives at an elevation on 1,350 meter, meter, meter elevation, take its source from, from, from the Munali Hill on the, on the southeast, on, on the southeast. And our mapping war activities basically covered the active sand mining here in blue, uh, here in blue, and active sand mining areas with each up, upstream on the south. Also, the portion of the river downstream that in, here in red that have been completely plated of, of sand, and also over infrastructure around in the site, including the, the main national road here, going directly to Lusaka. And the, the very close proximity of the Nesenga primary and secondary school to where the sand is mined and farm plums are on the site. Then post-processing, well, what, what, what you can say is that from the blue, the blue polygons where, where actually have, have active sand mining, upstream, the active sand mining of DHC is still operating as well. 
And this is causing uh, a depletion of cyan downstream represented by the red line here. And you can see that in, 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 in small green here, the very close proximity of the of the of the Nesenga primary secondary school to where the sand is mined. Then, in terms of extracted materials, uh, we 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 have been about to 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 get the information that the sand extraction on this side is done by the dry mainly during the dry season, where we where where we can we can have for uh, about two hundred checks. 230 tons, 230 tons trucks load per day transported from the site to Lusaka, which is the equivalent of 6,000 tons per day. And then during the wet season, we've we've only 50 with 50 trucks per day, which still which is still the equivalent of 1,000 tons. That leads to to a total of 270,000 tons. Of sand extracted from said during the rainy season, and up to one million and eighty thousands of sand extracted during the dry season, which bring a total of a, of a million and three hundred fifty thousand tons of sand extracted per year, per year from only this site. Compared to the total sand production estimated for for domestic cement production in Lusaka, with a mixed ratio of one one by two cement to sand used, this site is actually producing a significant amount of sand source for Lusaka use, which actually represents about 27.8% of materials. And mainly the site is, is strategically, strategically important because of its, its proximity to Lusaka, to Lusaka, 70 kilometers with uh, uh, um, a main, a main national road close by the site where the water sand is extracted. In comparison, if with a 1,350, with the 1 million 50,000 50, tons per year, this site in the sand is actually producing, producing uh, quite, uh, quite a huge amount of the total production requires from uh, uh, requires in, 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 in cement production in Lusaka, which is estimated at 4 million eight eight hundred fifty thousand per year. In terms of socioeconomic and gender issues, what if, what we've been able to observe from site is, is the woman is that woman is highly involved in, in, in sand mining by for, for, for men contribution is most on on food selling and loading. But also, boys and girls are, are prefer to to do sand mining at an early age, as 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 from what I said, it's a quick source of income rather than continue to to, to study at schools, and also that's all the situation that leads to teenage to teenage to teenage pregnancy, but things that we all observe from 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 our site investigation, and in terms of environmental impacts, well. Well, first we consider that rivers are naturally capable to generate sand from the position. Here's problem occurs because the extraction is actually exceeding the river capacity to process the sedimentation. And with the actual increase on, on demand, it, it, it is rarely the case where the river is the river can generate regenerate fast enough to end the damage. And in Zambia, the main visible impact, environmental visible impact are on our firstly the lowering of the river the river table things that you can see on, on the on the picture one as as a reference if you look at the, the construction here close to the bridge the actual river table level is is about four meters down down where where, where it was during, during when this country have been have been have been established and in second and secondly the most visible also the erosion of river banks and you can see in picture two well we we thought that we see that the river banks itself is collapsing which leads to to, to widening the river beds and causing to the waterway to change and at some portion it's have it's have been we have seen that this this river by changing the waterway the river is become shallow at some point which ultimately can lead to to, to totally trade this portion of the river. 
and the and the last but not the least is the close proximity of the sand the sand mining plots to the Nasenga Primary and Secondary School, which causing noisy turbulence and a lot of air pollution for for the school. And now, as a way forward to this project, uh, I, I mean, as, as a as a proposed policy to address the issues. What, what we want to suggest is the, the introduction of a sand extraction allowance trade scheme or a SEEDS policy, where hot tax is to be enforced for sand input. So the tax can be can be considered a trade policy to generate revenues, but also it includes an export, export and import tax implementation where where the authorities will be imposing uh, will be imposing of uh, and enforce a tariff. As a second policy, we would enforce the local authorities' responsibility on site supervising by conducting environmental impact assessment before the site opening or a site closure, and then establish a strategic environment and, and social assessment for the sector. And third, we, uh, we, we recommend assessing a, a, a general sensitization program for, for, for mining professionals on gender impacts to address the needs and and the potential development for communities by creating economic opportunities and especially especially for women for, for more and specific actions and then fourth we would introduce introduce a, a reverse and purchase permits for local residential house construction and for large-scale construction project the sand should be only sold from quarries and over cultural sand sources. And as a way forward, further studies is, is suggested here as we are feeling after uh, after this after the time span and spread that we've finally been able to see the top of the iceberg now. So firstly, more some more studies on sediment estimation and deposition rate <clears throat> is recommended is recommended. Then we'd be able to, to, to study the bed of transport by, uh, by using geometry and, and, and doing some suspended solid settlement modeling in relation to the river flow rates. Uh, we, also, we also recommend further studies on, on, on determination of sand grade or quality through sediment columns to identify particle size to, to establish a particle size classification and find me its mechanical properties, but also infer uh, some historical estimation of extracted volume and its impact by using remote sensing and air observation techniques, we will bring very good values to, to, talk, to address the problems and mining in Zambia. But we conclude our presentation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you all. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that uh, overview of uh, of that uh, serious problem. It looks like there's a lot of uh, a lot of erosion going on there in uh, in the river. So uh, I hope you can um, make some progress on that. Thank you very much. Um, are there are there any questions um, for the sand sand mining group? I thought it was. Uh, An unintended consequence. You had a you had an equation there where you said that sand mining leads to teenage pregnancy, and I wonder if anybody would have thought of that ahead of time uh, as an as a consequence. Um, I just thought that was an interesting finding, um, something you never would have never would have occurred to uh, to anyone um, based on their. Uh, you had said that they'd rather work in the uh, doing sand mining than go to school. I think. Uh, you had mentioned yesterday some declining uh, school um, uh, attendance due to this this problem. Can you can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So from basically what we were to say as the, teen, uh, the teenage teenage pregnancy is mainly because uh, is 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 really uh, is really a consequence of of early 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 abandon uh, abandon of schools. For, from boys and girls, because from instead of continuous studying and and, and progress until university, 
boys and girls are their preferences preferences by looking on the incomes of their parents or or the neighbor made at the Dinsen Main in very early at, at early age starting to be involved in the business and 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 if very early age started to bring it to to, to create a family which causes uh you know a, a very a, a decrease in attendance at schools and and it is Somewhere, it's it is mainly it's, it's the main pro, it is mainly caused by the, the very close proximity of the same discussion to 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 to, to the Chiquile villages, as if if you go back to the to the map here, we can see that the village where the same is actually mean is 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 set it just right right the road for to to for easy transportation. But then all the all all all, all, all the students, all the all the children who want, who go to school is about to see how how big how big is the how how big is the uh, the sign many business just from through the windows and how many people is involved there, which is then uh, you know make them take take the decision to to, to abandon schools early at the early age and start living by themselves from from this business. So it sounds like the proximity to the school um, makes it uh, uh, very tempting for them because it's yeah, so close by. That's that's yeah. yeah, exactly. That's what's happening there. So Patrick uh, has a question. He says, early last year, uh, Zima called for legalizing sand mining. Any progress made? Yeah, this is this is this is thing I've been aware, I've been aware. and yes, uh, actually, late, uh, last year in June, June twenty twenty one. They may have started to 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 to, to address the problems and mining by making available for 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 us for send for send miners the uh, 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 e platform for, for to get license. So the idea to idea was to to facilitate to access to access to send mining license, and then bring more regulation bring more regulation to the sector. Up today we we. We, we didn't yet been able to, to get any statistic from Zima on how hot boys uh, have been made on that on, the, on that point, but from from the nursing side, what we can see is that more uh, none none of the sellers that have have been yet been aware of 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 this platform and have didn't started to 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 approach the Zima yet. While well, mainly the, the only process in place are to contact the the district the district authorities in uh, of Chikakanta to get to get some some of direction to transport the, the sand and to extract the, the materials from the from from the river. Did you did you uh, figure out what the proportion of illegal to legal or or, or informal to formal? sand mining was wasn't there a large percentage that it was on informal or, or illegal uh yeah we, we we made we made some research around the questions and what you can see is that mainly the uh this uh the, sand, the demand for science in zambia is mainly is actually mainly from river it is actually because because river uh, Tribute, river tributary for in in the southern province are are not per, uh, not per, per permanently fluidin. It is easier for for it is very easier and cheaper to extract sands from river during the dry season, rather than using uh, quarries. And actually, we've only seen few few few, few explosion permits distributed from the many cadastral uh, authorities. For for sand for sand query, which uh, at the moment is still on, under exploration. To say that mainly the sand demand is responded by illegal 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 extraction from river at the moment. Okay, uh, Moses uh, has a question, and this will be the last one because we're uh, we're out of time now. So go ahead, Moses. Thank you and, and good morning. It's a comment on the on the question you asked about what has Zima done and what other authorities like the Ministry of Mines have done. First, 
As sand mining requires an artisanal mining license. That's the first thing. So if anyone mining sand does not have an artisanal or license from the Ministry of Mines, then it means this particular individual group, they are doing that illegally. And that's the biggest problem. That's the illegality of mining without any a permit from the Ministry of Mines. Then what, what Zima has done is we produced what is called guidelines for the construction sector. And you find that Lusaka is mostly not a mining city, but a construction city. So all the sand that is being extracted is basically being used in the construction uh, sector. So learning from what we did in the mining region called the copper belt, what we did is if you are producing sand and you want to sell, for example, to a cement production or a, a smelting um, facility, if the smelting or cement production facility buys sand from anyone with no permit from the Ministry of Mines, we as the environmental regulator will have to penalize the one buying the sand because you are promoting the illegality. That has helped us because we don't see illegal sand miners mining sand and going to sell to the smelter or to the cement company. So we will go that route and make sure that the construction sector does not buy sand from anybody who does not have it a permit from the Ministry of Mines and it will stop the illegality. Great, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, so I think that uh, concludes our, our presentation for today. I wanna thank all of the uh, project leaders, all of the uh, student participants, all of the project partners, all of the instructors and sponsors. Um, Everyone did a great job. We really appreciate uh, all the work you've done. Uh, you have great results. I hope you've, uh, you've benefited from it as much as we have. And uh, I look forward to, um, to receiving your final reports. Um, uh, if you wouldn't mind sending me the PowerPoints and, uh, and also uh, send the, your hours. And uh, yes, the answer to your question, everything uh, will, has been recorded and it will be uploaded. So if anyone needs a copy of the recording, it'll be sometime in uh, early next week. Uh, I can send uh, a link to the recordings. Um, anyway, thanks, thanks again to everyone. Uh, really enjoyed working with you all and uh, uh, please keep in touch. So um, that concludes our presentation for today. Thank you to everyone for your participation. <laughs>